Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Brussels. Good morning. Welcome to this session. I'm very happy to see how well attended uh, the session is. Obviously, I, I understand that the, the topic uh, that we're covering in this session is really at the core uh, of uh, the theme for, for this year's forum, so understandably it attracts uh, a lot of interest. Um, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Uh, we have quite a wide panel, which I'll introduce to you in a second. Um, also, we have, I'm, I'm conscious that we have a very diverse uh, audience here, and uh, I would like, uh, to the greatest extent possible, given the number of you, uh, for this session to be as uh, interactive as possible and for us to have a real discussion and for you to have an opportunity to put questions to the panel, to make uh, remarks that you would like to make, even to put questions to each other. Um, I would like this, uh, I think we would like this to be uh, as much as possible an inter interactive session. It's, it's also uh, for a session for you. Uh, and I'd also like, of course, at the beginning to thank you all and to thank the organizers uh, for your interest and your engagement uh, in, in this event. Please be conscious, though, that there are so many of you, and that means that we should try to keep interventions to the point um, on topic uh, as, much, uh, as much as possible. Um, then perhaps just a couple of practical things. So we've quite a long session. I think we're here till one o'clock. Uh, but we will break for coffee. And we've been given a, slot, a coffee slot of 11.20, I think. Um, it's important that we keep to that rather um, in a disciplined way, I believe, because the, the coffee breaks are being staggered so that everybody is not taking, all the sessions are not taking coffee at the same time. So I will be uh, sticking to that. I would also like, I think as a practical matter, to, to mix a bit, to have some presentations in the first session, some in the second session, so that we have a mix of presentations and then an opportunity for questions and, and remarks uh, from you. Um, then a few other practical points. Um, please use your microphones. Um, as you probably know, this session is being recorded. I think it will be, it's being web streamed uh, as, as far as I know. Uh, so it's important that uh, you use the microphones. Um, when you do, then please use your, please state your name and your, and your uh, organization so that we know uh, who you are and where you come from, who you represent. Um, also, in terms of background uh, reading, reference material, I've been asked to make sure that you're aware uh, that there is a, a publications room uh, downstairs on the ground floor, 0C, that has, uh, has many publications that are of interest. And you've also seen, I think, the background document with a very exhaustive list of, um, of documents that are, uh, that are referred to there. Um, I've also been asked to remind you to be sensitive to any children that are intervening. I'm actually looking around the room, and I'm not sure that there are any present, but young, young, young people. OK, <laughs> yes, indeed. People who are detained <laughs> as children. OK, no, indeed, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a good point. And, um, so indeed, the sensitivity should extend not just to, to children themselves, but also to those who have had experiences uh, as children or uh, young people who have uh, stories to tell us. Um, then uh, I mentioned interactivity. I believe there's also an app uh, that provides you with an opportunity to ask questions, uh, a survey uh, app. I, I haven't um, <laughs> tried it out myself, but apparently it's something uh, that you can use, and I think that we can consult during the coffee break to see if, if all the topics that uh, you would like to be covered have been, uh, have been covered. Um, in terms of uh, speakers on this side, um, Melanie and myself have been given uh, time slots of 10 minutes, and then I would ask the other speakers to not exceed 15 minutes in their, in their presentations, and I'll try to hold you 
uh, to that. Then I will briefly introduce the panel, and then I'll, f I'll say a few words myself uh, before uh, we launch uh, the session. I guess I should introduce myself first. I'm uh, Stephen Ryan. I'm the deputy head of the asylum unit in DG Home in the European Commission. And I've been dealing with asylum policy already for quite some years. Uh, to my right is Melanie Teff, uh, who is uh, the co-chair today. And she is um, the senior child rights advisor for the International Detention Coalition based in the UK, if I understand correctly, and you have a background as a lawyer uh, in the UK, also an academic, uh, academic background. Um, but you can correct, of course, anything that I say incorrectly. Uh, then uh, to her right is uh, Eliska Hodijova, uh, who has held a number of positions, I think, in the Czech administration over the last years. And I think you're currently the agent before the European Court of Human Rights uh, for the Czech Republic. Mm. Mm. Well, I work uh, for the Department of the Government Agent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mike, yeah. To my left is Pinar Aksu, who will be providing personal testimony uh, for us today, uh, and who's also, I think, engaged in advocacy work um, uh, in the UK. You're based in Scotland, as far as I know, and uh, you, you'll get an opportunity to introduce yourself later. Then uh, we have Gert uh, um, Verbaheda, yes. uh, who has been working for a <laughs> For, um, for quite some years for the Belgian administration in a number of uh, different positions, uh, but particularly, uh, I think, in the return area. So he's a, he's a specialist uh, in, that, uh, in that area, and he'll be talking to us about, in particular, I think, about alternatives to detention that are used in Belgium. Uh, then, again, on my left, uh, we have Niklas uh, Ax, uh, Axelsson from the Swedish Migration Board. Uh, who also has extensive legal experience, and if I'm not mistaken, also some <coughs> managerial experience in, in uh, detention and reception uh, facilities. So you really have uh, on-hand experience of uh, that, kind of, uh, that kind of work. Uh, so we look forward to, to hearing uh, about uh, the, the approach being taken in Belgium, in, in uh, Sweden, I should say. Uh, then, further to my right, uh, we have Katarzyna Slubik, um, who is from Poland uh, and who, who works there, I think, also for a, an Alternatives to Detention Network. Um, ah, she's not there. She's, uh, ah, she is there. She is there. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, and then further to her right, uh, we have Poppy uh, Gliva. Uh, who is working uh, in Greece, I think, uh, uh, in um, uh, organizing shelters uh, for, for, for unaccompanied minors, uh, so. both on the, on, on the mainland and, uh, and on the islands, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I have a person on the panel who is just Radostina Pavlova, is correct? That's you. Yes, okay. And you're working uh, for the Center for Legal Aid of uh, Voice in Bulgaria. So you have uh, uh, good insight into the situation in Bulgaria uh, for, for minors and unaccompanied minors, which we look forward to, uh, to hearing about. Okay. Um, what I will do is uh, to, to introduce the session, I think this is the same in all panels, I will say a few words about the, the legal framework here in the European Union when it comes to the detention of uh, minors. Uh, and then I'll also set, I'll say a few words to set the scene in terms of uh, the European Commission's policy approach uh, to the detention of minors. And then to set the scene a bit in terms of the themes uh, that I think we will need uh, to be covering uh, during, today's, um, during today's session. Um, so just to briefly outline this, and I'm going to paraphrase a bit what I think is already in your, 
uh, in your background material. Uh, but just to say that European Union law uh, allows for the detention of irregular migrants and asylum seekers in certain very clearly defined circumstances. And it also allows uh, in even more restricted circumstances for the detention of minors. Uh, and that, that means minors who are, who are together with family groups and unaccompanied minors. And the current legal framework, the detailed legal framework, the, the essence of it is contained in two main instruments, one which dates from, from 2008, the return directive, that's the framework that governs the detention of irregular migrants for the purposes of their return. And the other one is the reception conditions directive, the asylum reception conditions directive, which dates from 2013, and it governs uh, the, the, uh, the framework uh, for the detention of uh, minor uh, asylum seekers. So as you can see, they're both relatively recent legal instruments. It's an area that has only recently been regulated uh, in, in the European Union. Um, I'll say a word about the, the specific provisions on detention, but of course there are a lot of other uh, provisions within the acquis, within our, our, our legal framework that are also relevant from the perspective of minors. We have extensive guarantees when it comes to um, uh, the, the institution of guardianship, uh, age assessment and so on that are all either directly or indirectly relevant uh, to the topics we're discussing today, but I won't, uh, I won't go into those. Um, then, just to say a word about the, frame, the legal framework for detention generally and then for, for minors specifically, and to bear in mind, of course, that this framework is also complemented by jurisprudence from the court in Luxembourg and the court in Strasbourg, and indeed we have had some quite extensive jurisprudence, especially from the court in Strasbourg in recent years, when it comes to the conditions of detention, the circumstances in which judicial review is appropriate, arbitrariness of detention, and so on. So uh, it's also something to be kept in mind. Then to the legal framework. So what the, what the law prescribes is that persons should only be detained when it's necessary and on certain specified grounds. And the grounds are, are quite brief and, and exhaustive grounds. Uh, in the return context, it's possible only to return for the purposes of preparing or carrying out the return proce uh, process when there's a risk of absconding or when there is a lack of cooperation by the intended uh, returnee. Uh, and the Reception Conditions Directive contains uh, six specific grounds that I won't uh, list out, but they're all uh, related either to ensuring the efficiency, the effectiveness of the assessment of the asylum claim, uh, or the, the effectiveness of the process. So for example, one of the grounds on which it's possible to detain somebody is in the context of a border procedure. So in order for a procedure to happen quickly at the border, and another uh, ground is for the purposes of ensuring uh, um, a Dublin transfer from one uh, from, one, from one member state to another. Decisions must always be individualized. Um, a person should only be kept in detention for the shortest possible uh, period of time and only for so long as it's necessary. So for so long as the ground, the grounds that I just mentioned, uh, still, still apply and in the case of return, for so long as there is still what's, what's termed a reasonable prospect uh, of the person being returned. And then, crucially, the law provides uh, very explicitly uh, that detention should only be contemplated where other less coercive measures, uh, and in, in the return context it specifies that they must also be sufficient, cannot be applied effectively. And this is a reference basically to alternatives to detention. And in fact, it's clearly spelled out that member states must have alternatives to detention uh, in, uh, provided for uh, in, in the law. And there's a number of other guarantees, important guarantees, that the detention order must be in writing. There has to be a possibility of judicial review. That judicial review has to happen quickly. There should be free uh, 
legal assistance. Uh, there are provisions then also uh, relating to the conditions, the material conditions of detention. Um, there are provisions about the right for, for family members to access, to visit people uh, who are in detention, uh, uh, as well as uh, representatives, advisors, legal advisors, and, uh, and so on. And then there are some specific provisions uh, relating to the detention of minors. Uh, and again, here I'll paraphrase uh, the, the essence of, of the main additional guarantees uh, for minors, both in the return and in the uh, asylum area. Um, it's very specifically stated that minors can only be detained as a measure of last resort for the shortest period of time and that all efforts should be made to release detained minors and place them in accommodation suitable to minors. Um, in the asylum area, it's underlined that unaccompanied minors should only be detained in exceptional circumstances, never in prison accommodation, and that they must always be kept separate from, from adults. Uh, and then when it comes to the detention of families with minors, um, they must be detained, they must be provided with uh, separate accommodation that, that guarantees adequate uh, privacy for, uh, for the family. Um, and there is also a requirement, a general requirement for minors that they should have access to leisure and uh, recreational activities. Um, there are also some, the, the last uh, remark I'll make on the legal framework, there's some very specific restrictions on the use of the border procedures that I referred to in the case uh, of unaccompanied minors. The circumstances in which it can be applied are, um, uh, are fewer than, than, than is the case for, for adults. Um, and the last point relating to the legal framework, I think, to underline is that there must always be a best interests assessment made at every stage uh, of, of the process, either in the return area or in the, uh, in the asylum area. Uh, and that means that a best in, in the context of detention, it means that a best interest assessment must always be made if the detention of a minor, of a child, is being, is being contemplated. And of course, uh, in that context, clearly, the health, and in particular the mental health, uh, of children must always be taken into account as part of that assessment. So I think it's really important to underline that. It's not just a soft consideration. It's in the legal framework. It is an absolute uh, requirement. And as I mentioned, of course, also the other flanking uh, safeguards regarding guardianship and so on are also particularly relevant, I think, when it comes to the question of detention, because the guardian's uh, role is, is, is to represent the child also when it comes to um, drawing attention to uh, the, the drawbacks associated with, uh, with detention. Then, uh, when it comes to policy, um, I think the, the best thing to say about that is that, um, or the best thing to draw your attention to is uh, the communication that the Commission issued in April of this year, children's communication, I think it's been referred to on numerous occasions uh, during this forum. And there, there's a very specific um, uh, few sentences in the middle of the communication that address the situation of uh, migrant detention of uh, children. Uh, and it underlines uh, that they should, um, it, well, it, firstly, it makes the, the uh, how would I say, the, the remark that it has been a phenomenon. It points to the phenomenon that we have had uh, detention of, of children in circumstances where the reason for that was because of the lack of availability of suitable alternative accommodation, a general lack of capacity uh, and, and so children end up uh, in, in detention. Uh, and it, it says that this is, is, is something that is, uh, that is not uh, acceptable, and I think that was underlined also by Simon Mordew in his intervention uh, yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Uh, it also then points to the legal framework and says and, and recalls the exceptionality of detention uh, that it should really be only resorted to in the most exceptional circumstances when it is uh, 
uh, really necessary and there is no effective uh, alternative to it. Uh, and then in terms of action points uh, for uh, the future, um, the, uh, the, the, there is a, uh, a significant emphasis on uh, developing and promoting and making available uh, effective alternatives to detention. Um, I think it would, uh, it would also be important to, to point out that the Commission has also um, said, and in particular in the return context, that uh, notwithstanding the, the drawbacks uh, that uh, the detention of children has, that member states should still have this possibility of detaining persons for return purposes uh, available to them. Uh, and that is spelled out in the recommendation that was made last, uh, last March. And again, it's spelled out in, in a revision uh, that was made recently to the return handbook, uh, emphasizing that um, uh, this should be a, a possibility as a last resort, uh, but at the same time emphasizing that it must always be subject to a best interest assessment um, and that alternatives uh, must be made available by member states that that is an absolute uh, an absolute requirement um, then in terms of uh, themes for for our discussion what I would um, ask you I think uh, to keep in mind um, during these discussions because I know that uh, you you come from 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 diverse backgrounds but there is a there is a significant, I would say, uh, proportion of you that come from civil society and, and, who, uh, uh, and who are not coming from the governmental side of things. And I'm speaking on the governmental side, so I also would like to, to make a, a, a couple of remarks there that I think have to be kept in mind. Um, I think it's important to remember that there, there will always be, there is an inevitable tension between the fact that detention is sometimes required as a measure of last resort for migration management purposes, whether it's in the asylum area, whether it's in the return uh, for, for return areas. And that is an, uh, an imperative that has to always be kept in mind. It's not something that we can, uh, that we can ignore, that there are circumstances in which uh, it is important that um, persons be prevented from absconding, and that includes family groups, and it sometimes includes uh, unaccompanied minors. Um, and that, there is that tension, but it always has to be weighed against, of course, the very well-known harmful effects that detention has on all persons, but in particular on children, uh, in particular the psychological uh, um, harmful effects. Um, and the, I think then the, the other parameter to keep in mind is, uh, I, would, I would try to put it like this, is the real world versus the ideal world. Um, we, we live in a very imperfect world. And uh, we, we also have seen, I think, over the last couple of years, especially the last two or three years, that member states, uh, governments, authorities can find themselves faced with situations that they had not been able to predict. And they find uh, themselves having to cope with situations that are far from ideal, having to, to deal with uh, having, having limited resources, having limited options available to them. And that means that um, when assessments are made by governments, by authorities, uh, at the highest level, at the lowest level, they have to take account of the, the realities that they face. Um, and I think that's important to keep in mind. Uh, in, in an ideal world, we would have perfect alternatives to detention in all circumstances, but we all know that that's not the case. Uh, so what we, I think, we have to strive towards in, in this session and, and, uh, and going forward is to work towards alternatives to detention that are effective, effective in the sense that they, they are really alternatives to detention. So they, they also um, prevent uh, absconding and, and, and so on, effective in that sense, but are at the same time 
uh, compatible with uh, the the human rights and the dignity of of of, of persons and children in particular, and that take account of resource constraints on member states, logistical constraints uh, on, on member states. So I think with those, those words, I think we'll, we'll move to, to the next panelists. Um, I would also say uh, that um, we should probably devote quite a bit of our session to talking about alternatives to detention. We will talk, and I think that is reflected in the, uh, in, in the various presentations that, that we have here today, because that's the, the positive way, if you like, of, uh, of looking at this. So with that, I hand you over to Melanie. Thank you very much. Um, I'm uh, with the International Detention Coalition, um, and we're an NGO network of over 300 members in more than 70 countries. And um, the work of the, the IDC is aiming to limit the unnecessary use of immigration detention, to end the immigration detention of children, and to promote the use of alternatives to detention. And we've been asked to co-chair this session, I think, because of um, the fact that alternatives to, de to detention have been the main focus of IDC's work, really, over the past decade, and um, in Europe, but also outside of Europe, so we have comparisons around the world. The IDC defines alternatives to detention to mean any law, policy, or practice by which persons are not detained for reasons related to their migration status. So we have a very broad definition, because we are interested in all the things that governments can do to prevent detention and to ensure children's best interests in, in this case. Um, approaches that are initially called alternatives uh, because governments start using them instead of, de instead of detention could later become part of the mainstream approach, we hope, to, mainstream, to migration governance. For us, it's about putting in place the building blocks for systems that don't rely on detention. Um, and um, some key messages we ha we'd like um, to, to get across from the IDC for this session is it is possible for, st for states to move away from detaining children while achieving better outcomes, and those outcomes for the governments involved and for the children involved. Um, we need to shift the focus in Europe to alternatives that are proven to work. And from the IDC's perspective, from the research we've done, that's engagement through case management. Um, engagement with people, um, people who are going through the migration system and the asylum system. And the third point for us is that every government can take steps, work with civil society to develop, strengthen and expand engagement-based alternatives and to work towards the commitment that 193 governments made in the New York Declaration to end immigration detention of children. There's a real opportunity to expand alternatives to detention in Europe. And um, for a long time, the focus in this region has been on what might be called traditional or enforcement-based alternatives to detention, borrowed from the criminal justice system. Um, but this isn't, these people are not in the criminal justice system, so it's a, it's a different model. And the, these restrictions and conditions allow governments a greater sense of control over certain actions and choices of individuals. But there's little evidence that restrictions in and of themselves promote case resolution and compliance with final outcomes, which is a, a government's interest in this. The IDC believes that in Europe, there's a real scope and a need to shift the focus to understand and develop engagement-based alternatives that actually work to improve the effectiveness of procedures in achieving case resolution, as well as respecting rights. IDC has done a five-year program of research and looked at 250 examples in 60 countries. And uh, we have a, our, our There Are Alternatives handbook, which some of you may have seen. It's online. Um, we found that um, alternatives that are successful are those uh, which achieve very high compliance rates. Um, they, they, they can achieve compli high compliance rates of between 70 and 99 percent. And um, higher levels of case resolution and voluntary return at a fraction of the cost of detention, less than 20% of the cost of detention um, as an average. If we look at the growing body of international research, the, um, the, best, uh, the most effective elements to manage people without detention are elements that engage people in immigration procedures, 
in particular through tailored case, case management. And that involves a social work approach, empowering and building trust to work towards resolution of their case. Um, in our programme of research, the, the main elements of successful alternatives to detention that we found in terms of cost, compliance and well-being are using screening and assessment to tailor management and placement decisions, including best interest assessments, um, providing holistic case management focused on case resolution and, and children's best interests, early engagement, not just uh, at the stage of return, but early engagement with an individual or a family, family to look at all the options in their case, not just return, but all of the options, return being one of the options. Um, ensuring individuals are well informed and they trust they've been through a fair and timely process, ensuring that their fundamental rights are respected and basic needs are met. Um, ensuring all options to remain in the country legally uh, are, are considered um, and all avenues for voluntary or independent departure and imposing any and any conditions imposed shouldn't be overly onerous when, when it's not necessary. Um, alternatives that only focus on conditions and enforcement measures in our experience are not going to build a context in which a person is willing to accept the conditions or the outcomes imposed upon them um, and in the end it, governments are hoping uh, for a situation where we're not going to have enforced returns. And we found that those, when you have engagement-based alternatives, you have people more willing to comply with, with, with the process that is affecting them. Um, it's particularly important that people get full information about what's happening to them. Um, and that applies for unaccompanied children and for children and families in an age-appropriate way. We heard yesterday from Golam, um, and, we'll, and, and we also heard from uh, Pinar about what it was like <coughs> to be detained as a child. Um, and engagement-based alternatives are an opportunity to make sure that children in the situation of Golam and Pinar can avoid this harmful experience in the future. These alternatives avoid violations of children, a child's rights and improve the well-being of children and their families. Engagement-based alternatives work especially well for tackling complex cases. And I just point to the uh, two of the European Commission recommendations, the, the communication um, on the protection of children in migration that um, Stephen referred to, says that everything possible must be done to ensure a viable range of alternatives to, the, uh, to detention of children is available and accessible. And the returns handbook, which uh, we, we may not agree with all aspects of, but it, it does refer specifically to tailored individual coaching, to early engagement, to holistic case management, um, and to a systematic horizontal, horizontal coaching of all potential returnees that looks not just at return, but all possibilities for legal stay and asylum. So that is um, specifically set out in the return handbook. Um, the, we think that, um, I mean, today's panel also will we'll be hearing from a number of civil society groups who've been working in depth on developing alternatives to detention that work and, can, and speaking from their experience. We find that civil society is, is in a good position to build trust with migrants, and we hope that governments will build on NGO capacity and expertise to work with them to develop alternatives to detention. Um, the ones that have worked best in our experience are those where there have been partnerships between government and NGOs, and, and that will often end up with better outcomes for governments and individuals. I'd point people also to the um, joint statement of 49 um, NGOs and UN agencies on, um, called Let's Work to End Child Immigration Detention that's available in the uh, documents room, um, which makes some important po points about um, how we can work together on this. Um, I'd like to emphasize there's no one-size-fits-all model. The best alternatives require a process of change that adapts according to the systems and challenges of the national context. It's a process rather than a matter of finding ready-made solutions. And we believe that government should be encouraged to keep taking steps towards ending child immigration detention and including strengthening alternatives where they're not working. Um, we, we hope there wouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction when things are, are not going so well to just immediately resort to detention. We think that should lead to an evaluation of what's, what isn't going well and adapting the alternative, not just going back to detention, but adapting. Um, piloting alternatives to detention programs based on case management is one way for states to test models and adapt approaches based on the results of the qualitative and quantitative evaluations. And we'll hear from some pilot programs today. 
more needs to be done in Europe on alternatives to detention yet. We've, we've, we've talked a lot about it, but in practice, there are not that many p children and families who are able to get access. Um, and this session offers a real opportunity. We're hoping it will give, help governments and other stakeholders to understand from current examples what were the steps taken to set up those programmes and what more can be done to expand alternatives to detention. And we were at a key moment, and uh, as we put on the slide here, it's time. And there's growing, there really is growing momentum on this issue. The New York Declaration for Refugees and Migrants was one year ago, a global political commitment to end immigration detention of children. Um, the global compacts on refugees and migrants, uh, um, re refugees and on migration, are in the process of being developed. Um, some people in the room here are part of the, including the IDC, are part of the Initiative for Child Rights in the Global Compacts, and that's advocating for a commitment um, on, uh, for the commitment in the New York Declaration on ending immigration detention of children to be put into practice. Um, and it's worth noting that the Committee on the Rights of the Child and the Committee on Migrant Workers have, are elaborating a joint general, general comment on the human rights of children in the context of international migration. And the draft um, states that the prohibition of child and family detention should be ensured in law and in practice. So uh, not, not just in a last, uh, as a last resort, but a, a prohibition. Um, and there's growing momentum for engagement-based alternatives in Europe. Um, you'll hear from a couple of the panelists about the European Alternatives to Detention Network, which was set up in March this year, linking organisations running case management-based pilot projects in Bulgaria, Cyprus, Poland and the UK. And th that network aims to collectively build a knowledge and evidence base to support other governments and NGOs to develop engagement-based alternatives in the European Union. We have two network members speaking on the panel who are going to explain further and now is the time for Europe to expand the use of alternatives to detention for all children, whether alone or with family, whether in asylum procedures or facing return. There are alternatives that allow governments to pursue case resolution and that also allow children to live without the scars of detention. Thank you. I hope we're going to have a, a very productive conversation today. Thank you very much indeed, Melanie. Um, and it's indeed it's excellent that we have two members uh, of, of of this new network uh, here present, um, uh, and we also have. I mean, you you mentioned. I'm not on the mic here, I see. Um, uh, let's then move. Uh, I think next speaker would be uh, Eliska uh, Hodijova, uh, who will be, I think, reporting back to us on a recent, uh, recent conference that was held in Prague uh, on, on this topic. Elisha. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it is my pleasure uh, to present here a short summary report from the conference Immigration Detention of Children Coming to a Close, uh, which was held at the end of September in Prague. And it was hosted by the Czech Chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers of Council of Europe. And it was organized by the Ministry of Justice of the Czech Republic in a close collaboration uh, with the Council of Europe. Uh, it was an expert conference. It was not a political one. So the aim of the conference was not, uh, was not to have a political declaration. Uh, the aims of the conference um, were basically, okay, ask you for present. It's fine. Yeah. Um, so the aims of the conference were basically to enhance understanding of international human rights standards on the detention of migrant children to identify and share good practices in implementing alternatives to detention and to explore 
uh, possible steps how to move forward to, uh, the, the, to the end of detention of uh, migrant children. And uh, there were, I think, three main topics which were discussed uh, during the conference. And it were experiences and findings from the field, uh, existing international standards relating to detention of migrant children, and of course, the alternatives uh, to detention. Um, I would now start probably with uh, the experiences and findings from the field. Um, unfortunately, it is important to realize that detention of migrant children is still a reality. Uh, we can observe uh, that it is even making a comeback since uh, the peak of the migration crisis, which was here in 2015 and 2016. And there are uh, countries in Europe where we can see a backward movement. Uh, it means that we extend uh, conditions or time uh, when a detention of uh, migrant children is, is allowed. And what is highly problematic is that it is often uh, applied as an, an automatic measure, not as a measure of last resort. We have also heard some recent findings of the European Committee uh, for the Prevention of Torture and Inhuman and Degrading Treatment. Uh, the committee has visited a uh, number of uh, detention facilities and uh, it's reported that uh, there are places where conditions where children are deprived of liberty are, absolutely, uh, are absol absolutely inappropriate. We're also detained in prison cell in cells, uh, police cells or in prisons with uh, no access to shower, for example. So this is really, really very bad. And uh, of course, uh, the impact of the detention on children, the psychological impact, was, was discussed intensively. Uh, we know that uh, detention affects even uh, those who never suffered mental illness. Maybe uh, up to 50% of people who, who are in detention uh, way start to suffer from some mental illness. And even a short-term detention often causes very serious and long-lasting harm to children. And uh, the, the problems, the illness mostly uh, takes longer than the, than the detention itself. And we can uh, see that there is a negative aspect, uh, impact of the, de 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 detention, even if the conditions are, are adequate. As for the international standards relating to detention of migrant children, um, uh, we can see clearly that uh, all the international human rights norms are increasingly against the detention of migrant children. If we, look, uh, if we have a look on the documents of the UNHCR, of the UN Committee for the Rights of Child, on the reports of CPT, the PACE campaign, or the reports of the Commissioner for Human Rights, all these documents uh, tend to say that uh, the detention of migrant children is not acceptable. Um, the European Court for, for Human Rights is not uh, there yet, but uh, at least it is restricting the possibilities of states to use uh, the, the, the detention and it is pushing the, the countries to consider uh, alternatives carefully. Uh, we can uh, see an interesting shift in recent case law, in uh, cases against France, AM against France, or AB and others against France, where the court uh, found violation of Article 3. It were, it were cases, these cases uh, concern situation of families with uh, small children, and the court uh, is just um, shifting from examining the conditions of detention to age of the children and um, more mainly to the duration of the detention. So even if the, if the conditions in the uh, detention facilities were adequate in these cases, the, the court uh, found, it, uh, found it as a violation and problematic to, to detain small children in these facilities. And uh, there is a clear message that uh, detention can never be in the, in, in the best interest of the child. We can't argue that detention uh, can help to protection of the children. And uh, there is a clear message that uh, detention can be used just as a measure of the last resort. Uh, alternatives to detention were also, of course, discussed. 
and we have heard a few examples of a promising practice, uh, both from European countries and also from countries outside Europe. Uh, there were practical challenges and obstacles of uh, the effective implementation discussed. And uh, there was, I think, one uh, message um, repeated of, uh, quite often that uh, alternatives remain unused in practice, and it is mostly because of the concern of the states about their effectiveness, about absconding of, of the migrants. Uh, so maybe that's also why uh, expert group uh, of working within the Council of Europe, which is called CDDH MIC, is now uh, was now focusing in its report on the uh, elements of the prerequisites of uh, the effectiveness of alternatives, and uh, it um, summarized in its report some uh, some former studies on alternatives, and uh, the. Uh, the report uh, actually actually highlighted six elements which are important for, for effective uh, alternatives, and they are uh, screening and assessment of individual access to the information, ensuring legal assistance, building trust uh, in asylum and migration procedure, uh, safeguarding dignity and fundamental rights, and uh, it was also uh, stressed that uh, this case management, as already Melanie, Melanie said, is essential for, for making the alternative, uh, alternative effective. And now I'm just uh, getting to the conclusion, and I would like to, um, to highlight some of the outcomes of the conference. So uh, it is well known, but still it's important to say that detention is never in the best interest of the child. And the reason is very obvious. Uh, detention is potentially very harmful for the health and for the development of the child. According to international law, the space for detention is extremely narrow and almost close to nothing. Uh, detention of migrant children uh, is, pro is prohibited as a general rule and there are very few exceptions when uh, it is still allowed. Uh, there are already alternatives to detention which are effective in practice and we, 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 we should use them more, definitely. And um, there were also uh, discussed a few ideas on what uh, shall be improved in order to, to end, the end the detention. Uh, important is definitely a good guardianship system, uh, which is essential for effective protection of children from the risk of abuse and violence. Age assessment procedure is also um, important and it should be, it should be uh, done in a way which is, uh, which is quick and which is dignified. Yeah, there are, there are reports, according to reports of CPT, it's not conducted in a dignified way always nowadays. And the family reunif re reunification should be, should be speed up. Although I said at the very beginning that uh, there was no like, political declaration, uh, um, there was no outcome like that from the conference, I think that the key message of the conference was quite clear. And it was that in a free democratic society on a, of the 21st century, we must do all we possibly can to avoid getting used to the image of children behind bars. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you are interested uh, in uh, learning more information from the conference, please have a look at the website, which is dmcprague2017.justice.cz. And you can find there uh, videos from all the panels. And uh, we are also working on a report, which will be released soon. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eliska, and I think uh, the conclusions that you just uh, outlined, I think they echo many of the same uh, themes and the same findings uh, that we have been hearing uh, over the last uh, 24 hours or so. Um, uh, the next uh, speaker will be um, uh, Pinar Aksu. Um, I'd like to give the floor to her, I think, to give uh, some personal testimony uh, 
based on her experiences. Um, hi everyone. I hope everyone is still like awake or in the process of that. Um, my name is Punar Aksu um, and today I'm going to talk about my experience and also give everybody some advice <laughs> in how to make this work in a more community-based level. Um, my family and myself, um, when I was eight years old, we moved to UK back in 2001. And obviously at that time, um, as a child, I didn't have the opportunity or um, I didn't have the chance to say no I'm going to stay back in the village or I'm going to just stay in here by myself so obviously as a child you do move with your parent and go along with their decision um, when we moved um, we moved to England to London first however back in 2001 they had a dispersal program which I'm sure everyone is aware of where they usually send families to different <coughs> areas of the country so my family and many other families was um, one of the family who got sent to Scotland. Um, and when you get sent to area, you don't know if um, where you're going to get sent to, basically. And we had no idea where Scotland was, and they just put you into a bus. And the journey is about seven, eight hours. Um, and then they just drop you off to your location of um, where they are housing you. So they um, usually house people in high-rise flats um, and into areas where um, the local community wouldn't live or into the houses where they don't house um, the local community. Um, as an asylum seeker in the UK, there are certain rules that um, you have to apply to. The first one is you cannot work. Um, you get sent to the local primary school without your choice, so you just get sent to the nearest one. Um, the other barriers are um, you cannot go to university. Um, if you do go to university, you will be charged as an international student. Um, education in Scotland is free, so if you do go to university, you would be charged thousands of amount of money, which obviously uh, we wouldn't have had on us. Um, and no one would want to be charging as an international student. Um, we were seeking asylum for about six uh, to seven years. And there was a period of time where nobody had any decision made on their cases. And during 2006, 2007, the Home Office started detaining many of the families, individuals, to send people back to their countries, depending <coughs> on their cases. So my family was one of them. Um, we were detained twice. Um, the first one was for about five days. And then after that, we, were, we had to go and sign on, which is... Um, like a place, um, it's a place called Festival Court in Glasgow, where you go on a weekly basis or fortnight basis to say that you're still in the country and not, that you've not left. So we were doing that for on a weekly basis. And on my sister's birthday, on her fourth birthday after school, we all went to sign on. And that's when they detained us. Um, we were sent to Dangaville, uh, which is a detention center in Scotland. And after a week, we were sent down to Yarlswood, which is a um, kind of bigger detention centre for families down in England. Um, we ended up staying there for two months. When we were sent to the detention centre, we were one of the first families who had arrived there. But as weeks passed on, more families arrived from different parts of the world. And I describe um, Yarlswood and Dungaval as a prison because I don't see a difference between a prison and a detention centre. You are put behind by uh, a wall. You, ha you are not allowed to get out of the place and you are treated as a criminal where they come and check on you in the morning and afternoon and in the evening to see if you are still in the detention centre, which is a way of dehumanising you and which is a way of making you feel hopeless and making you feel even bad, even more bad because you, they do know that you're not, there's not a way of getting out of the detention center or escaping, escaping it. So the, they use this method to make you feel um, more um, dehumanized. Um, in detention centers, I, as I'm sure most of you have heard, there are many people who try to commit suicide because they see that that's the only way um, of get, getting out of the detention center. And at that time, I did witness a couple of times people trying to commit suicide using different ways, either their shoelaces or drinking shampoo or 
um, yeah, do, diff using different ways. Um, after staying two months, uh, my family was one of the lucky ones. Um, we were uh, we were out from detention um, centre, and this was done uh, through local campaigning and from campaigning organisations uh, who took on board for my family. They collected letters from the local community and they talked with our teachers and my classmates, and this, they used this as a method of uh, bringing us from detention um, centres. Groups such as Glasgow Campaign to Welcome Refugee Unity Centre and Right to Remain played a very key role in helping my family. After coming out of um, detention centre, when I went back into, the, into my school, it was a really awkward situation because the, my friends were like, oh, I thought you, you got sent back to your country and we had to write you a letter and we don't know why you had to, we had to write you a letter. And it was, I had to like kind of explain and justify that, oh, actually it was because of this and because of being the age of 14, 15, it was quite embarrassing to not knowing the system at the time to express yourself and to, <coughs> to, to, to say that what happened to you, um, to the family. Um, I went on to study community development and I finished my master's in human rights and international politics. And the main reason why I wanted to kind of study this was to maybe work with the UN or EU to change, um, yeah, to make change basically. However, the more I studied, the more I found that it's very difficult um, to make change in, in a global um, in, the, in the global um, side of it, um, because it comes down to the states whether they apply into the legal terms or not. So if a state says, sorry, I'm not going to do this, then um, it's very hard for you to make a change. So I decided to kind of work more with the community and within Scotland um, to make changes. In Scotland in 2010, um, it was announced that the detention of children um, in Dangeville would be ended, um, which was a great success for everyone and for all the campaigners. <coughs> um, however, um, even though this was promised in 2010, um, an alternative detention was built called Cedars, and unfortunately it is expected that children, um, the detention of children will rise in 2018 as they are thinking of closing the detention centre, Cedars, and children would be transferred to the Tinsley House Adult Detention Centre. For me, I would say that no child should be in detention, but if they are being detained, it is obviously better, uh, obviously better that significant efforts are put in to place to make a facility safe for children rather than put them into a prison for adults. One important strategy to help end child detention is to engage with the local people, building connections and organising meetings, multicultural and community events and marches to welcome refugees, such as the annual UN Anti-Racism Day, which helps to create a platform to understand one another. These types of events help to educate and connect people so they know there is no them and us, and there is only um, all of us. Engagement relies on dialogue and understanding and campaigns at local and national level must have elements that dispel myths about migrants and refugees and work equally to empower refugees and migrants and show the positive role that we play in the community. Um, the following are my suggestions for alternatives to detention. Um, I would say that children can live in house with their family um, and this has been shown to enable people to meet, meet their basic needs. And it costs less, allows them to support, and it is more humane. We must ensure that alternatives to detention <coughs> are exactly this, and not alternative forms of detention. For me, a person should not be detained for seeking safety and refuge in another country, let alone a child. It is a very basic human right not to be tortured or treated inhumanely and not to be discriminated based on race, colour, religion and birthplace. It is important to create local and national campaigns, as I have uh, mentioned. One of the examples is when I was involved, um, and Nicholas was involved as well, with the Living Library event uh, at the Council of Europe, coordinated by the Global Campaign to End Child Detention. And in this, during this event, the parliamentarians could borrow us as a book um, 
or other experts in the living library for up to 10 minutes uh, and we would go and talk about conversations of our expertise. And it adds a human face to the situation dry, uh, beyond dry statistics and reports. It creates discussion, dialogue and understanding, which was a great way to start the three-year parliament, uh, parliamentary campaign to end child immigration detention. Secondly, I think it's very important to have a strategy to engage with politicians and all of the arms of a governmental system. It is important to show the human cost of policies, but it is also important that political will is built. Sometimes these two can be challenging to do at the same time, with politicians defend defending the ethics of their current <coughs> position. We must understand how we can use the current political environment to build governmental en uh, engagement. And also, um, child rights organisations need to do more by consistently using evidence and international instruments such as the human rights treaties, the CRC and the Refugee Convention and the other methods that's been mentioned earlier. It is important to use the legal instruments as a tool for the country to change its policy. The global compacts present uh, an opportunity for us to hold our governments to account. The commitments they have made in the New York Declaration to work towards ending child detention could be nothing more if we do not find a way to motivate them to implement international legal standards. Um, and I would like to also share some of the things that I've have <coughs> observed in the past couple of days in here. I could say that Detention creates both isolation, mental health issues, and is a structural strategy to make you feel hopeless. Private companies um, usually run detention centers, such as Serco G4S, and the main thing that they care about is how to save money and how to um, make people feel more bad, and they don't really do care about how the conditions of the detention centers are. Um, there has to be pressure to, uh, towards governments so that they could implement what is being talked about um, uh, with, the with the documents uh, which are being created. And finally, I would like to thank everyone and all the NGOs who work with people during their journey to safety. We might at times feel depressed um, and not know how to react or not know how to do the work. However, it is the exact reaction the powerful, the right wing, and the capitalist system wants us to feel like, so that they will take us away the power of hope from um, our hands. The work of NGOs and local community are very important for me. For this reason, we all must continue in our work to end child detention and create a humane system where people are not treated as numbers, but where people are treated as people. I would like to ask everyone a favor. Um, if you have ever traveled or if you have ever moved a country or if your parents or grandparents have ever moved a country, could you please all get up, if you don't mind? <laughs> so, on our feet. <laughs> So if you've moved a country, your parents, or if you have fled to somewhere else, could you all get up? Yeah. I would like everybody to, to look around the room and think of, so everybody look around the room, <laughs> and think of what makes us a refugee, what makes us a migrant, and when do we stop becoming a refugee? When do we stop becoming a migrant? You could all sit down. Thank you. <laughs> if I don't take action, if you don't take action, no one else will take any action and make any measurements. Where there is hope, there will always be change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pinar, for those um, I think very inspiring uh, words and uh, for giving us an insight, I think a very touching uh, insight into your personal experiences uh, of the realities of um, being detained uh, as a child with your family. Um, and also for your advice and for uh, the tips that you have uh, for governments uh, in terms of uh, providing alternatives. Um, 
One of the the alternatives that you mentioned was uh, housing children with with their families, um, and I think that that is a good uh, way of leading us to our next presentation, which is from uh, Gert um, Verbaheda <clears throat> uh, from the Belgian um, Immigration Office, uh, who will talk to us, I think, about uh, alternatives to detention uh, that are are being used in Belgium, including uh, those kinds of uh, those kinds of options. Um, I'm also looking at the clock, so I'd like to, I'd like this to be then the last presentation before we take a coffee break. I'm also conscious, though, that we haven't thrown uh, the the session open to the floor yet. Um, depending on how long uh, the presentation of Gert lasts, um, we could still have uh, a discussion before the coffee break. If not, we'll do it directly uh, after that. Um, I think we still have four more panelists to speak for the second session, so we have to, to try and squeeze uh, everything in. But I'll hand the floor over to Geert. Thank you, Stephen. Um, I have put my clock on, so uh, I can keep the time then. Um, so I'm not going to talk about other alternatives to detention because there are also other alternatives to detention existing in Belgium. Uh, so I focus myself on, on families with minor children. Um, families because we do not detain unaccompanied minors. So that's already something to, to emphasize. And we do not forcibly remove unaccompanied minors either. So there we are for once on the positive side. <laughs> um, since 2015, uh, we have created, uh, which was already in the, in the law, but not uh, yet implemented, uh, also a coaching at home, which means that we, for the moment, for a limited amount of, of irregular staying families linked to the capacity of, of staff we have to, to do that, we, we go to meet families who have received a, a return decision. You must understand, in Belgium, between around, on a yearly basis, 2,000 to 4,000 families receive return decisions, which is a lot. And we cannot see every family. Normally, they receive a leaflet with information, and if, if possible, in their language or in a language they understand, which give them information. And it, it's for all the return decisions like that, uh, not only for families. Uh, and where they can uh, ask for uh, AVR and where they should go for assistance, etc. But of course, uh, it's always better to explain also the things to the, to the families, but we are not in the possibility to meet all those 2,000 to 4,000 families. For that, I have asked repeatedly staff. Uh, I started with 40, uh, then I limited myself to 20, uh, but every time the Belgian minister said to me, no, we don't have the money for that for the moment. Uh, but I hope in the future we will have so for the moment, we do have some staff who is uh, doing those interviews, but they only can see a few hundred families per year maximum on the basis of that limited capacity because they, have, they do that with other tasks as well. So the, the, the families who are coached at home, they are given the opportunity to organize their return from their own homes. They, are, they have no... Uh, 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 obligation to go to another uh, place where, th where they have to organize their return. They can stay there. The families are invited for an interview. Uh, there is a, 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 quite a sort of convention which is signed between the families and the immigration office. Uh, and uh, of course, it, this is provided that they fulfill some conditions plus show their willingness to comply. If there is no compliance, then we go further in the in the what I call the tired system, and then there would be a transfer to open family units. Uh, further, I will talk about the legal basis on which we have based this system on coaching at home. So I must say, for the moment, the compliance rate is rather good. It's about 95%, but the return rate is rather low. That's around, only around 5%. So that we can still increase a lot. Uh, because you have not to forget, some of those families have already received uh, many decisions uh, on many procedures. So 
they are at the end of the line, and that's why we try to convince them to use the, the system of voluntary return, but it's not easy. And I, I think everyone knows that it's not always too, uh, too uh, easy to convince people to uh, comply with something they don't think is better for them. Um, second part of the tired situation is in fact the, the, the oldest part of the tired uh, uh, procedure, which is the family units, uh, which is the main bulk of my presentation. The family units, um, so to give a, 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 few, a few bullets on what happened before, until 98 there was no detention except for border cases from 2001 until 2001 onwards, one of the parents was de detained, which was not uh, very effective because a lot of the other mem family members absconded. Uh, uh, until October 2008, then we have, between 2001 and 2008, we have detention of families as a whole. Uh, until uh, 2009, we had uh, also still possibility for border cases. <coughs> but since October 2009, no more families are detained as for now. I have to emphasize this, as for now. Why this change? There was a, a lot of pressure of NGOs and parliament to seek for alternatives. Uh, we made a, a report on a, uh, um, from an external strategy agency which gives us the possibility of different alternatives. They went also to visit uh, uh, some other member states, amongst others, Netherlands and Sweden. Um, they, uh, this report was presented to the Parliament and we had then made some recommendations and made some tests. Uh, one of the tests was in March 2008 uh, where we had invited uh, um, <coughs> families to come to talk about the possibilities to organize their return at the immigration office. It was not a good idea. We had, should have better done it somewhere in a local municipality and not at the immigration office because we were the bad guys and they want to com don't want to come to the bad guys and only 10% of the invitees came and, and only 1% of the families returned. So uh, not so not so hugely successful. Uh, so we had to think about something else. That's why in October 2008 we, we, we created our uh, what was then called still the Family Identification and Return Unit. The name has a bit changed now, but I'm not going to, to give the name because it's, it's even more difficult to, uh, to, to uh, explain. Uh, so we have return officers, coaches of the immigration office. So they are working for the immigration office, but they are not involved in any way in the procedures of the, of the family. So to, to get a, a, a sort of independent status towards the families that they are not uh, involved in taking the procedure uh, uh, which has led to uh, put them in the return, uh, in the return units. Um, the, the families are assisted by the return officers in the preparation of the return, in the legal questions, in the logistical matters, for example, if they have still some uh, properties or, or, or luggage which should be also uh, forwarded home, uh, then they would look for possibilities to, to rent a com uh, container where they put the, the luggage inside because sometimes the luggage is so huge after many years of irregular my, uh, staying in, 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 uh, in Belgium uh, that it would not be possible to take it all with the, with, with the flight. So they, they then possibility to rent a container, for example. Uh, we are not blind for specific situations. Uh, sometimes you, 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 you see the families then for the first time. They have been, they have been in procedures many years, they have, but all written procedures, and were never at the immigration office, so they don't know who the families are until you are meeting them. And then you see that sometimes there are some uh, particulars which could not be known before because the family had not communicated it or the lawyer has not communicated it and which would impede a, a return. And in some cases we have even regularized the family. So we are not blind for that. Uh, so it, even if it, it is a 
return unit, a family unit, still there are families which are uh, regularized in that return unit so that they can stay in Belgium. Um, so we all cooperate, of course, with IOM uh, to organize the, AV the AVR. Uh, we were sponsored by the EU Return Fund, which is in the meanwhile the AMIF. Uh, the, uh, the, the, but uh, we are still getting money from the AMIF, which is very important for us because some of the costs uh, can be recuperated on that matter then. Uh, we work together with local authorities and with NGOs. Uh, um, very important is, the, is the, the cooperation with the local authorities because at the beginning we had always an information session in the, in the municipalities to explain what we are going to do there and, and the population was always cr out crying, oh, there will be criminality, etc. Uh, uh, what is going on here? They will put here people uh, which will uh, in decrease the value of our houses, etc. Uh, and after a few years, Everyone's forgotten that those houses were there. They were community-based, and no one, w oh, they are still here. I didn't know that. That's something we had as a reaction from some of the neighbors. So that's a good thing, uh, that it's a low-profile community-based system uh, which works in the community. Um, we have, for the moment, nine coaches for 27 units. Uh, so uh, it's not a lot, but it's still okay. Uh, we have one coordinating staff member, which is who is some, sitting somewhere over there. Uh, Ils, wave a bit. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> and we have also two technical support guys uh, who uh, always uh, look at, at uh, some of the things who are going to be broken in the houses, because every time there will be something broken in one of the 27 houses. Um, so, as I said already, it's a community-based uh, house uh, it's, or apartment in, in the community, uh, in the municipality. It's, it's former police force houses, so in the, in the, before the, the police reform in Belgium, police officers had to live again next to the police office, uh, which is not anymore the case. Uh, um, as I said already, 27 family units, they are completely equipped and furnished. Uh, there's one family uh, per unit for privacy reasons. And it can happen in very rare situations that we have already put two families in one house because of, the, of some of the bigger houses can easily lodge uh, 12 to 15 persons. So uh, we don't have families of 12 to 15 persons, luckily. It happens. The biggest family we had was 27, so, and they were housed in three different houses. Huh? Um, children can go to school. We have agreements with the primary schools, and on a case-by-case -case, uh, arrangement, we have also uh, arrangements with secondary schools. Secondary schools are a bit further uh, from the houses um, in most of the cases. Uh, not every municipality where we are situated have a secondary school. That's why we look at the case-by-case -case basis. I have to emphasize also many of the children continue to go to, uh, if they are in secondary school, continue to go to their old secondary school as long as they are in the houses. Um, and also, it is a minority uh, of secondary school uh, children, aged children. So the, most of the children are uh, young children l younger than 12 years old. Uh, the biggest group is between 6 and 12 years old. Uh, we have toys, TVs, uh, DVDs in the family units. There are children books in, in foreign languages, but in a limited amount available. Um, and the problem is there that they are not so easy to find, uh, children's book in, in, in other languages. Uh, so if you have some children's book laying, laying around, please send them to me. Uh, I can always forward them to the houses. Uh, there is internet access ad hoc for the moment via the coaches, but we are working on a, a permanent uh, internet access. There is, of course, the medical support, which is 
no problem at all. They, they, they are seen on a, on, a, on, a, on a frequent basis by the, the doctors. And, and children, if they don't get, had, have had their vaccines yet, they, they get the vaccines on our costs. So all is carried out on our costs. Uh, special needs are foreseen uh, also for the return, of course. Specifically for children, it's very important to, to foresee special needs. And there is also contact with the children's welfare agencies who sometimes come to control whether everything is okay. Um, so that's where they are situated. Um, some photos, you see, they are not bad. Some of our colleagues asked me, can we move in? Uh, so. And he, he doesn't want now. Yes. Um, so I know now what I'm going to say is not popular, but it's also the, the third part of the tiered uh, procedure. We have, for the moment, still a, a bigger group of absconding. Uh, so for the moment, uh, we have a non-compliance of 35%. It was higher. It, it, a few years ago, it was 45%. So it has decreased, which is good. But 35% is still not good enough for me. Uh, so in 2011, there was a decision of the Secretary of State for Migration and Asylum to create dedicated family units in a detention center, uh, prefab vacation houses with necessary infrastructure and dedicated staff, separated from the rest. And I see that my time is over. Um, but I'm going to finish. Uh, and that's for specific uh, cases who are not complying with the, um, the, the rules of the family units. Uh, and it would be only for a, a short time and only as a last resort. So after the tired <coughs> procedure has been done, so first the coaching at home, secondly the family units, and only then if they would not comply with the rules of the of the family units so if they would abscond out of the family units then it would be there that they would be put and also very important only for families who are really removable uh, so if if they don't have documentation it has no use to put them there um, so that's very important eh? and um, maximum two weeks because we have appeal possibilities and of course the people have to have the possibility to to uh, to put a large a suspensive appeal and the timing for that is beginning of 2018 but i'm saying this every year uh, so i will see if it is will be 2018 uh, because it's already seven years they're talking about it they have to start to work on it so that's the the, the legislative framework for your information you will receive afterwards the the presentations. Um, so it's a relatively positive uh, evaluation we got uh, from, from different sides. Uh, we have also a lot of visitors, the Council of Europe is already to visit us, the EU, uh, the EU Parliament, uh, member states, other third country uh, authorities. Um, so they are now an embedded return procedure, they are no longer a is deemed as a project uh, and we need still to further our cooperation with other agencies and also with the the other organizations to to uh, to have a more effective way of working with those family units and if you want to have a uh, a view on how it is working, you are always welcome to visit us. But there is also a documentary made by the Dutch television. Uh, by uh, That's the website of the... Of, and uh, there you see how it is in real life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert, uh, for that. Um, I think... Um, interesting presentation uh, of, I think we would describe it as a success story, a relative success story in any event, um, of a community-based uh, project uh, for the uh, for providing alternatives uh, for the detention of, uh, um, uh, of families with children. Um, I'm looking at the time. Uh, this is, uh, it says 11.20, which is the time for our allotted coffee break. 
Um, and I'm conscious that we still haven't uh, opened uh, the discussion to the floor. So what I think we should do is we should take the coffee break and then we can have a, a, a discussion from the floor immediately when we, when we come back. Uh, that will, I think, also give us the opportunity to consult uh, the app that I mentioned uh, in the introduction uh, if, if any of you have had a chance to, to flag some topics that you would like to be discussed. And then we'll also uh, have time then for the other four uh, speakers uh, from the panel uh, on our side. You have 20 minutes uh, for coffee. Um, please stick to that. Uh, apparently a bell will be, will be rung five minutes before the end of the coffee break. So see you in 20 minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Um, so, as I said, uh, we still have four panelists on this side. Uh, but before I turn to um, the first panelist, I'd like to, to ask for a few interventions from the floor, questions or remarks or observations. Um, if any of you would like to intervene, just raise your hand. Uh, I was approached by one gentleman during the break who I promised to give the floor to, so I'll give the floor to him first. Um, but then, yeah, you can think about whether I see a gentleman over there who'd like to intervene, and over there. Okay, so quite a few of you. So, But let's start with um, this gentleman in the front row. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark van den Rijk. I'm Belgian, but I am on a volunteer basis working for the Smile the Child, which is a large NGO in Greece uh, for child care and child protection, and also involved, of course, in the migration issue. Um, we have been talking yesterday and today a lot about alternatives, of course, and everybody is very much in favor of alternatives, but there is a but to that. Um, looking at the situation in Greece, um, camps are being closed, and people are being transferred into apartments, dragging along children also. The fear is that, first of all, this move may be a, an element of hiding the visibility of migrants in the, in the broader society. And above all, also our concern as an organization that is, uh, that, that is very much um, uh, investing in holistic approaches um, that uh, putting those children with their families and young adults of 17 and 18 years old uh, into apartments uh, without uh, further ado and without taking care of the education, reintegration into education, uh, reintegration into or integration into the health system and so on and so forth, that you're basically creating a problem, that uh, you are creating uh, a number of, uh, of, of groups of young, young people and children that are worse off with the alternative than with detention, to the extent that there are specific cases of families with children that were moved into apartments and that spontaneously go back into a camp. One has to be very careful about that. Um, of course, uh, it is true that detention is uh, not, uh, not something that we want, that uh, detention is despicable. We all agree on that. That is not what I want to say. Just the message, the, my message is just that we have to be careful that the alternative also has quality and that uh, it is being seen in a holistic approach. And we, as the Smile the Child in Greece, are not particularly confident that that is a scenario that is actually going to happen right now. We are very much looking forward uh, to see how AMIF is going to react to that now that it takes over the situation from ECHO, as uh, the emergency element seems not to be there anymore, according to the European Union, and ECHO is being basically replaced by AMIF. We would like AMIF, which is DG Home, we would like AMIF to, to pay a lot of attention to the holistic approach, and we are looking forward as an NGO to work together with AMIF on this particular element. Thank you. Okay, thank you indeed. I think you, you made an important point there about the quality of alternatives. It's not enough just to to look at it in terms of uh, the kind of accommodation that's provided or, or whatever, but at the whole package, the, the integration measures that go with it and so on. Um, I don't know if there are any of the panelists who'd like to come back on, on that. Melanie. I mean, just, just to say that in IEC's research, one of, one of the elements that we saw for an alternative to, deten to detention being effective and successful was that basic needs are met and access to, to services and fundamental rights are respected. Without that, then nothing else is going to function, including compliance with migration procedures. Um, and, and so I completely agree. Um, other persons who wish to intervene, this gentleman here, please remember as well, and then uh, I'll hand the floor to the gentleman on the left, please remember to 
to give your name and, and also the organization that you represent. Thank you. Uh, Michael Bohenik from Human Rights Watch. This is primarily for Stephen uh, Ryan, but maybe others will, will want to address this as well. Um, two, two related questions. One has to do with the European standards that you summarized at the beginning and how those match or don't match with the Committee on the Rights of the Child's current interpretations of the standard with respect to detention of children for immigration-related purposes, which, as you know, is uh, a call to expeditiously and completely cease it and a finding that it's never in children's best interest, which, again, seems to be uh, stronger, uh, is stronger, and thus uh, seems to be at odds with the European Union's uh, standards as you as you summarized, bearing in mind that every member state of the EU is a party to the convention, it does seem to be uh, unfortunate if there's an, uh, if there's a maintained inconsistency between the stronger international standard and the European Union uh, standard. The second question is more um, in terms of just uh, political responses, bearing in mind what we heard about from Melanie about the the, the New York Declaration. Um, we have at least a political commitment to work toward the ending of de immigration related detention of children. And I'm just wondering what the European Union's plans are to, to realize that political commitment. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll reply uh, then directly to that, and, but, but only very briefly because I cannot speak in a political sense for the European Union. Um, of course, you have, you have highlighted what uh, we're all aware of, that there is, I would say, at least um, a divergence in terms of uh, the tone, if you like, uh, between the international dialogue uh, among, at, in, uh, in the UN agencies uh, and uh, in, in, in international fora and uh, the reality of uh, European Union law and uh, the way it's applied uh, by, by member states. Um, I don't, however, think that there is a, let's say, a formal uh, incompatibility between any international norm that has been formally agreed at the international level and uh, the European Union uh, law framework. That might not remain the case forever. Who knows uh, what will, will happen in the international sphere. Um, but I think, um, and I think if that happens, if we move to a situation where there are formal international uh, norms which outlaw the detention of children, I think it will, it will, uh, it will probably lead to changes uh, at, the, at the EU law level. But I would just repeat that uh, the European Union legal framework really does underline the exceptionality of detention of children and emphasizes the importance and the obligation to provide for alternatives. Um, but of course, the legal framework doesn't represent the reality of how it's applied by, by all member states. And we're well aware, and the Commission is well aware, uh, of the fact that um, reality falls short uh, even of the legal obligations that the EU's legal framework provides. Okay. Um, gentleman on the left. Yeah. So, uh, I'm Kevin Byrne, uh, an independent expert. I actually just wanted to come back to how you framed the discussion, Stephen, at the beginning, um, kind of jumping off basically on what Melanie said in relation to the need to move the focus from detention to alternatives to detention. And I would actually say that there's a need to actually move the focus from migration, which is really what we're talking about, to child protection, which is what the issue. We're back talking about migrants as opposed to talking about children, you know? And I mean, I think that that's kind of part of the reality that we're accepting. Um, I was going to ask, maybe we should also stop talking about government like it's a single unit, etc. cetera. Um, I'm really pleased to hear all the positive initiatives that are coming from civil society. 
and indeed from the migration services um, and the asylum services themselves. But I actually wonder where are the departments of social welfare, where are the government agencies that are actually responsible for children? You know, they kind of seem to be um, missing and we haven't heard it. And that in some ways is where I would be looking for leadership on this um, issue from, really. I still find it difficult to believe that we've gotten to this stage, especially in relation to unaccompanied children, where we're actually debating whether or not they should be um, detained or not, or is there an alternative to detaining them? Because we've heard over the last three days just how vulnerable these children are. Um, and with any other child, you would be bringing them straight away to the social work office, or the child protection office, and, you know, you can visit the migration service next week when the protection needs are sorted out. So there is a danger, I think, in our thinking of actually accepting a paradigm that accepts that the migration process is actually the important process and that everything has to fit inside that. Because I, I just don't think that's actually going to, uh, to work for children. And I'm just not sure it's the right way to come at things. Is it? Okay, thanks for that. And um, perhaps we take then a couple of other remarks. Okay, I'll take the lady in green and then uh, the gentleman here in the middle. Uh, and then Chris there behind. And then I think we'll move to our, our panel. And then we'll have an opportunity, hopefully, towards the end uh, of the of the session to have more questions. Uh, OK, so let's start here. Uh, hello, my name is Fiele Peters, and I work for the Belgian Migration Office. I work for a unit which is specialized in unaccompanied minors. And me and my colleague, um, every day we uh, register unaccompanied minors who come to Belgium. Um, and as we all know, in 2015, not only Belgium, but all uh, European countries um, have challenged uh, the fact that a, a lot of uh, migrants, refugees, came to apply for asylum. And also in Belgium, we were flooded by unaccompanied minors, especially from Afghanistan and Syria, who came to apply for asylum. Now, that was a big challenge, but it was nothing compared with the challenge we're facing now. because. We coped with those children. They came from Afghanistan, Syria, and they asked for our help. They wanted to enter the procedure. Now we're facing another problem, which is the transit migrants, the unaccompanied children who come to Belgium or use Belgium as a transit country to go to another country. And on a daily basis, they're brought to us by the police while they've been intercepted or found in a park or I don't know. And we offer them everything because they have a right. They have a right to have a garden. They have a right to enter the procedure. They have the right to go to a center. They have the right to go to school. They have the right for medical, um, uh, for a doctor. So we offer them this and they want nothing. So in the end of the day, we have a 15-year-old boy or girl who wants nothing from us, who doesn't want to, her picture to be taken, her fingerprints to be taken, who doesn't want to tell us where she's coming from and what is her real identity. And the only thing she wants at the end of the day is go back to the park, Maximilian Park, where the smugglers are or the traffickers are, and to continue her journey to the UK. And at that point, I'm just, you know, it's very difficult for me personally when you're dealing with a real unaccompanied minor, girl or boy, at the end of the day to say, OK, here's the door. There you can go. There is the park. That alternative is just not good enough for me. And at that point, I'm just, you know, I just want to take that child and bring them to maybe not a detention center, but some kind of a secluded, secure environment where he and she or she is safe. So I'm just asking the panel and, and the people here, the experts, well, what is the alternative at a moment like that? Because we don't have a time to do a best interest assessment. At that. You're just here in front of that girl or boy for half an hour or one hour explaining them. We're not in our uniforms. We're all women there. We're trying to our best to be gentle and nice and explain them and really convince them. And at one point, a girl was you know, crying and taking my hand. And in the end, she didn't want to stay. She wanted to go to the park. So what can we do with those transit migrants, unaccompanied minors? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's a very good question, and I'd like to see if any of our panelists would like to address it. I mean, this is basically a situation that I think member state authorities find themselves faced with regularly, that some of the, 
the children that they encounter simply don't want intervention from the authorities. They want to be left to their own devices and to move on to the UK or whatever it is. And they resist um, being placed in care or, or whatever it is. So how, how does one deal with such a situation? And the, the IDC um, has uh, looked at this issue in many countries around the world of, of, tran of, of hosting transit, people in transit. And whilst um, a secondary movement can't always be prevented, we found that a, a range of strategies can be used by states to try and better understand and respond to that, this type of migration. And, and first of all, screening and assess assessment assist in understanding the factors driving the journeys. And I mean, I, I, I give the example, actually, I'm from the UK. It's interesting that in France, a lot of the children did not want um, to engage with the authorities in any way. They didn't want to apply for asylum. They didn't want their fingerprints taken um, because they wanted to come to the UK. When they did get some assistance, um, for example, from lawyers, it turned out that many of them had a legal right to get to the UK via, via Dublin. And actually, often engaging with some of the children, it's possible to find ways to achieve their aim legally. Similarly, we saw the same in Mexico with many families uh, going to the, to the USA. I'm not saying that's in every case, but it, 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 it is often the case that if, if a child feels that their situation is being seriously addressed by the child welfare authorities, including their need, basic needs being met, potentially while they're going through a, an official process, that, that's an incentive to, to, to work with the system. And if they fear that detention is going to be an outcome of being engaging with the authorities, then that's much less likely that they will. But I, I, you know, it, is, it is a challenge. I, I will react on that. We don't detain minors, eh? so that's, that's already something very important. We don't detain them. Uh, so that, that's already uh, something I, I don't comprehend why they listen more to the, comp to the smugglers than to us. Because they get all the information, and on a, on a regular basis, people went into the park, talk with the people, and then others came around us, staying. You don't have to listen to them, but because, because they are the bad guys. And that's how it worked in the, in the practice, and that frustrates us. That's not possible, something like that. We should work together. And to con convince that, g that girl or that boy that they have a possibility to stay in Belgium, that they have the possibility to apply for asylum, and, and not combat each other, uh, saying, no, 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 don't listen to the immigration office because they are the bad guys. That's not good. I mean, I think I, I, I say I understand the challenge, but also it requires people to understand, to listen and understand to children, why children are in the situation they're in. They're often in very complicated situations and under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressures from smugglers. And in some ways, if the offer of the child protection authorities, including legal assistance, isn't better than the offer that smugglers appear to be making um, the, to them, then, the, then children are, are torn in many directions. Okay, then uh, let's move on to, so this Hello everyone, my, my name is Kostas Simtopoulos from Greece. Uh, I work in the reception and identification service. Uh, I wanted to make another point, just a quick comment on the last one. Uh, I think the, the word of uh, smugglers is much more attractive to all the miners because uh, it's more absolute than uh, our words, uh, given the uh, what uh, the panelists said about you have the possibility to, to get asylum in, in Belgium. When you start the, the sentence, you have the possibility. It's much more uh, lighter than the smuggler who would say you will go to this place. But I just wanted to make another point. Um, we've been hearing so many interesting uh, opinions about alternatives to detention. I'm not going to say something new, just to stress the fact that uh, all actors should uh, try to, to suggest and convince the authorities to find alternatives to detention. Uh, but if for some reason we, we hit to a wall, we shouldn't stop our effort there. But at least we should uh, negotiate for visibility and transparency inside the detention centers. It doesn't mean that if it's not alternative to detention, we stop our effort. At least if there has to be a detention for some reason, and we can change that, 
to focus on transparency so that we know what's happening inside there. That's my point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Chris Nash from the European Network on Statelessness. Uh, earlier this year, uh, my organisation launched a report uh, protecting stateless persons from arbitrary detention, an agenda for change, the key finding from which was that a, a failure by states to identify stateless persons or to apply alternatives to protection was resulting in stateless people being detained for lengthy and often repeated periods, simply, in effect, being punished for having no country to which they could be returned. Now, this not only affects adults, but also it affects uh, individuals who arrived as children, but when they reach 18, they become deportable adults. And indeed, a detainee group in the UK published a report last week which highlighted this problem in the UK and also illustrated the, the insidious uh, interplay between uh, experiences of separated children in care, resulting in criminality, which resulted in criminal sentences uh, after they reached 18, and then they were subject to lengthy immigration detention, often for you know, very long periods. Uh, so I think it's really uh, a problem that they needs addressing. And you know, looking more broadly, uh, Pina spoke eloquently earlier on many subjects, but one was about access to education. And again, if, if nationality is not resolved, where children or young people are stateless, this can have a real block uh, on their lives. And when we consider that there's a growing number of stateless refugee and migrant children, you know, from countries such as Syria and Iraq, um, you know, we think it's a, a a part of this discussion that needs to be addressed. And to end with a question, I'd be interested to, to hear more from Stephen about what the European Commission is doing to improve the identification of stateless migrants. But for some of the government speakers, and we heard from the, the Belgium uh, Immigration Directorate, you know, what processes they have where they have families, perhaps with stateless parents, you know, are they deemed to be not cooperating when in fact they have no country to which they can return? Thank you. Um, Stateless persons are a, 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 a very few minute minority in Belgium. Um, we don't have a lot of stateless persons, uh, luckily. Um, so for children, we try to avoid statelessness. And the Belgian law has been changed that a, a child is born in Belgium if there is no nationality which can be designated to the child. Uh, then it will automatically become a Belgian citizen to avoid that the child becomes stateless. Uh, and I think it's a good thing that we have that system. Um, so um, I, I cannot remember to have had in my uh, family units uh, stateless persons. Uh, of course, for us, we, we look also to the, the effectivity of, of, of the possibility to return, because it's a, it's a return unit. So if we see that a, a family, for one reason or another, it can be procedural, medical, psychological, whatever reason, is not uh, fit to return to its country of origin, we will not put them in, in the system uh, of the family units. Uh, because it's a lost cause, uh, uh, um, then it's better to, to seek for alternatives to stay instead of to remove the person. Uh, and as I said also in my presentation, we have regularized families. Uh, we have now for the moment, uh, what I did not say, uh, our family units are having two functions. First, they are return units, and secondly, they are also what, I, what we could call a sort of reception uh, for families in irregular staging with, with minor children, because on the basis of a, of a constitutional law, dec uh, a constitutional court decree from some years ago, ago um, every minor child has the right to have shelter. And we, we also shelter families on that basis. Uh, and one of the families we have for the moment until now, because she's now moving out of the of the family sh shelter, uh, is um, a family uh, my, uh, where the, one of the minors is a Belgian citizen. So we are looking for uh, that family to to get to get a staying permit and not to go back to Angola in this case, because the child has a Belgian nationality. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you to, to Chris for the intervention on the specific uh, situation of uh, uh, stateless uh, children. Um, I think it's a phenomenon that varies very much uh, depending on, on the member state, but there are some member states where this is a real, a real issue indeed. I'm conscious of the time, so I will now ask uh, Axel from the, um, uh, Niklas, I should say, from the um, Swedish Migration Board uh, to say a few words to us about the situation in Sweden. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Niklas Axelsson. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. I will try to give you uh, a, a short overview over the, how we work with alternatives to detention in Sweden when it comes to children. But first, I would just like to give you a short description on, on what we do at the Migration Agency. Basically, we receive and consider uh, applications from people who want to come to Sweden or stay in Sweden from different, for different reasons. And we also decide who needs to leave the country. And we are also responsible for uh, the reception of asylum seekers and for operating the detention centers. Uh, since we are a bit short of time, I will just jump into the grounds for detention of uh, children. In Sweden, uh, basically, we only use detention uh, in the return process. Uh, we detain uh, families as well as unaccompanied minors. Uh, so I guess compared to Belgium, we are the, the bad guys uh, here today. Uh, there are three cases when we use detention uh, of children. The first case is if it's probable that the child will be refused entry with immediate enforcement. The other case is if the purpose is to enforce a refus refusal of entry order with immediate enforcement. In both of these cases, there has to be an obvious risk that the child will otherwise go into hiding and thereby jeopardize an enforcement that should not be delayed. Um, and the third case is if there's already a refusal of entry order with no immediate enforcement and it has proved not to be sufficient to place the child under supervision. A child can only be, t be detained for 72 hours <laughs> And this uh, period can be extended with another 72 hours, but after that, it's not possible to uh, prolong the detention of the child anymore. And the most common scenario in Sweden is that we have a child, an unaccompanied minor or child in, with the family in detention overnight prior to departure from, from Sweden. Last year, 108 <coughs> children were detained in Sweden, and in the same time, there were approximately 6,300 children in the return process. So, when it comes to alternatives to detention, then, actually, we only have one alternative to detention in Sweden, and that is supervision. Uh, it's issued on the same grounds as uh, detention. And it means that you are obliged to report in at a certain interval of time at the nearest migration agency office or the nearest police station. So it could be, for instance, two to three times a week that you have to report in and say that you are, that you are there. And it may also require that you have to give up your identification documents or uh, passport. Uh, so this is the only thing that's laid down in, in law. But we also have... Um, the caseworker support, uh, which could also be considered as an alternative to detention. Um, so when you apply for asylum in Sweden, you will be supported by a dedicated case officer or dedicated case officers. You will have a reception officer who will guide you through the reception or the migration process and also deal with the more practical issues like housing, daily allowances or special allowances, for instance. Uh, and the re reception officer will also be the person who is uh, uh, responsible for guiding the applicant through the return process as well. And the asylum officer is the person who is responsible for the asylum process and also to guide the asylum applicant through that process. So throughout the process, the applicant has dedicated officers who will guide her or him through the process and also give information about what will happen, why it will happen, and what's expected from the applicant. We want the applicant 
to understand the process and what's, what's happening and why. I think this is important uh, for all applicants in general, but in particular I think it goes for children. And also when it comes to children, we have a child policy that calls for us to have a child rights perspective in all our decisions that concerns children. Uh, and this means, amongst other things, that we have to look at different alternatives to decisions uh, from the child's point of view, and also that we have to analyze the consequence to the child of a decision that's made. And also, in all our decisions that concerns children, could be direct or indirect, we shall have a child consequence analysis. And it's part of the templates that we use uh, in our decisions. You will always have that part in our decisions. Um, so this child consequence analyst uh, should answer how the child's needs and rights has been regarded in the process. How has the child's rights and equal value been uh, taken in consideration? How has the best interest of the child been taken in consideration? What does legislation and or internal guidelines and uh, research case law say? And what will be the consequence for the child? And are there any conflicts of interest here? So altogether, we want to give a clear and concise uh, piece of information about the rights and duties during the process and about the consequences of non-compliance to make sure that the process and the measures taken, as well as the outcome of the decisions uh, that are made, will be understood and expected. So we believe that an individualized case management together with a transparent process where the child is treated with humanity and respect throughout the process is a good way in general to avoid the tension of children. And that this could also be considered as an alternative to detention uh, as well, even though it's not mentioned in the legislation as an alternative. So just uh, a bit about the unaccompanied minors and how we deal with them. Uh, there are several different authorities or stakeholders involved uh, in the process here. and. Um, they all have their different uh, responsibilities. <coughs> so the Swedish Migration Agency, uh, which I represent, then, is responsible for the asylum application itself, uh, to provide financial aid for the children, to work with return uh, if the application is rejected, and also to sign agreements with the municipalities on reception of unaccompanied minors who apply for asylum, and also for the children who are granted permission to stay. So when it comes to the municipalities, uh, when an unaccompanied minor uh, arrives in Sweden and applies for asylum, he or she will be offered temporary housing in the municipality where the child presents uh, him or herself to a Swedish authority. So in the, this, in the municipality of arrival, the social services administration will bear the responsibility of placing the child in a transit shelter or an arrival housing until the time uh, where the child can move to the assigned municipality. And the municipality that the child is later assigned to becomes responsible through the assignment for taking the child into care based on the Social Services Act. And the Social Services Administration in the assigned municipality is responsible for placing the child in suitable housing, usually a foster home or a group shelter uh, or treatment home. They are also responsible to appoint the guardian to the unaccompanied minor and for making sure that the child gets to go to school. The county council is also involved in the process and they are responsible to make sure that the unaccompanied minor gets the same health care that includes uh, psychiatric care and dental care as all uh, children residing in Sweden. Uh, so we don't differ if you are not Swedish or if you're a migrant. It's the same medical care for for all children. And then we have the guardian. Uh, the guardian would be the person who confirms the asylum application. And uh, it's also the person who gives the public counsel the power of attorney to act for the child in the asylum case. The guardian is responsible for the child's economy, uh, for instance, by making sure to apply for money when needed. It, this could be special allowance for 
winter clothing, uh, for instance. We're living in Sweden, so it's cold, uh, obviously. Um, they also help the child on searching for his or her parents via contacts with Red Cross, uh, etc. So, basically, the guardian would be the person who is responsible for assuring that the child is in a safe surrounding. And it means that there is a responsibility for this person, the guardian, to have a regular contact uh, with the child, the foster home and the school to make sure that the child is doing well and that the child's rights are actually taken care of. And finally, there's the public council who I mentioned, and that's the person who is responsible for representing the child in the asylum process from the judicial perspective. And the council is also the person who uh, lodges the appeal if the application is rejected. So I think altogether, the fact that there are different stakeholders with different responsibilities in relation to the child creates the possibility to actually make sure that the best interest of the child is considered here. And this, I think, means that we can reduce the risk at least to miss out on perspective, perspectives that is of, of importance for the child. So finally, just some uh, finishing remarks um, on detention uh, uh, versus alternative <coughs> to detention. I think we all need to bear in mind that to detain a person is expensive, uh, not only from an economical perspective, but also from a humani humanitarian perspective. And the benefits of providing for alternatives may lead actually to more people return voluntarily, and if we can use alternatives, there will be possible financial benefits. And since we can avoid the hardship related to detention, the human cost will also be less. Obviously, there can be an increased likelihood of absconding in a situation where we don't use detention. So I think the challenge here will actually be to find solutions with a good mix of alternatives to detention on one side and detention on the other hand. I think a complete absence of detention may be inefficient from a return perspective, but at the same time a system that's overly repressive, uh, where detention is used systematically, may also be ineffective, sin ineffective since there can be a lack of encouragement to cooperate in the return phase. And also to have a process that's transparent uh, and informative together with a good attitude towards the applicant, I think that's also something that creates possibilities to, in the end, avoid uh, detention. And when it comes to the unaccompanied minors, uh, I would like to stress the importance to have different stakeholders with different responsibilities uh, who can deal with the best interest of the child from their respective perspective. So I think the bottom line is that even though there has to be a possibility to detain children, there are alternatives and ways to avoid detention, and detention should actually be used uh, as a matter of last resort. So thank you for your patience. Okay, Niklas, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, now, I, we, we still have three more panelists. I'm going to ask the, the next three panelists uh, to try and really keep your presentations um, as uh, succinct as possible. All, all three of you, I think, have uh, important uh, points to make. The next two speakers are both um, members of the, the um, European Alternatives to Detention Network that Melanie referred to uh, at the outset. Um, and two of the, the coming panelists will be speaking about the situation in Bulgaria and Greece, where, as we know, there are particular challenges, very particular challenges, serious challenges in terms of uh, the situation of minors and unaccompanied minors in particular, so it would be important to hear from them. But first, I would like to hand the floor over to Katarzyna Slubik from, from Poland. Katarzyna. Thank you. Can I be heard? Yes. Okay. I'm just looking if I can see all of the presentation. 
Uh, okay. Um, uh, yes. Hello. I'm. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's a privilege. Um, mm, yeah. Maybe I will try this. <laughs> oh yes. I'm with SIP, which is a national um, Polish uh, organization. It's based in Warsaw. Uh, but I'm here to tell you a bit about how, uh, about the a European ATD network and basically what the civil society is doing currently at the moment to take matters into their own hands to start implementing alternatives to detention that are based on engagement and case management we initially without looking at the governments to act. Um, and trying to implement the values that are enshrined in the already mentioned today uh, IDC, there are alternatives um, research. Uh, just a few words about the organization. So as uh, every national organization, we try to do everything with the limited resources that we have. So we would uh, provide legal advice, but also uh, run advocacy, provide information, do research. Um, all of that with focus to enhance the well-being uh, of migrants and asylum seekers and refugees that are in Poland. Mm. Uh, we are quite active in the area of detention, in meaning that we try to fight it as we can. Um, Mm, so we would give legal consultation in detention centers, but also do monitoring visits in detention centers and issue post-monitoring reports. But also we deal with strategic litigation, um, of obviously advocacy. And we, as of June 2017, we implement an ATT pilot in order to gather evidence um, for advocacy, for the change in law, in practice, for the implementation of the uh, engagement-based alternatives. Just a few words, because I have to make it short, just a few words of, on detention of children in Poland. Um, um, to most, to, when it comes to children with families, the rules governing detention of adults would apply. So there are no, no specific rules that would concern children, but in any case, courts before applying uh, detention should consider best interests of the child. Um, and detention is a, as it is in the law, uh, should be a last resort measure. Um, uh, detention is possible to up to 18 months, but if asylum procedure in, uh, overlaps with the return procedures, it can be also prolonged up to for the six months. Um, when it comes to unaccompanied minors, um, uh, when they are um, not seeking asylum, then they can be uh, detained only if they are over 15 years old. Uh, and in any case, the court, besides the best interest of the child, should consider uh, physical and mental development of the child, their personality, circumstances of arrest, and uh, their personal circumstances. And uh, unaccompanied minors who are asylum seekers are not detained as a rule. Well, just a few numbers. You may be surprised and maybe um, Disappointed with how low the numbers are, but it's it's just the case. It's just that the migration flows to Poland are still not that high, and this is actually the uh, the major the whole the total number of children that are being detained. It's actually 25% of everybody that's being detained, so it's quite high. Uh, but yeah, but the, probably when you compare the numbers to the numbers that you have in your countries, it may sound um, not that serious, but obviously it's not. Um, what the key problem areas that we observe in uh, when it comes to child detention, besides the fact that there is child detention, um, it's the limited access to education in detention centers. Uh, even though some progress has been made, but it's still not the detention, the education that you would wish for a child that spends that. Uh, the months in detention. Uh, there's no uh, qualified psychological support for children. Um, and still, even though, as I mentioned, the law says the court should consider the best interest of the child, we do not actually see this in the detention decisions that we get for the families with children. So we, uh, uh, so the children are omitted in decisions. We do not see any reflection on the best interest of the child that the court would um, explain why the child should be put in detention. Um, Mm, uh, yes, so as I already mentioned, same rules for the adults uh, apply for children with families. Uh, um, all, uh, overall, uh, 
it's much better when it comes to children in detention, the conditions that they are in. It's much better than it used to be a couple of years ago. So uh, the authorities have made efforts to uh, adjust the detention centers to the um, uh, to, to create two detention centers that are adjusted to the needs of the child. But it's still obviously uh, not what we would like to see when it comes to protection of children in migration. Okay, so back to the European ATD network. Um, as I already mentioned, and as already, Melanie already mentioned, it was set up in March 2017, and it brings together civil society organizations that are developing case management-based pilot projects uh, in, five, uh, in five European countries. It should be UK, okay, so it's, it's sorry, <laughs> it's UK, Cyprus, Bulgaria, and Poland. Uh, at the moment, we had hopes that it would be five, sorry. Uh, um, Mm, but we also have, I will just show you the number of the organizations. Um, it's a wide range of organizations because we have national organizations here, but you also have platform organizations as PICOM, and you have international detention coalitions that are doing great uh, job at uh, advocacy at the international level. Uh, and then you have the national organizations that are developing ATD uh, pilots and gathering evidence that is necessary and crucial for the, for the advocacy. So just coming back, um, yes, so the network aims to reduce immigration detention, not just talking about it, but actually doing it. Um, and what we want to do is to demonstrate that detention is not necessary uh, when migrants are supported and treated as human beings in the community. Um, and what we aim to do is to build knowledge uh, and gather evidence, collect necessary experience and evidence to help the governments and other stakeholders develop an engagement-based ATDs. So generally the plan is to implement ATDs, find out what works and what doesn't, gather necessary evidence and just take all of this, this whole knowledge to the government, um, to the international institutions and show them, listen, we know, we already know that this works and you are looking for uh, effective alternatives. So this is how, so here we give you the evidence and please just implement them into the law. Because what we can see, what we have already heard in Prague actually, and what we, we're hearing here, here and there, uh, everywhere, that authorities are looking for effective alternatives, but they want to see evidence, they want to see cases, uh, they want to see numbers. So this is actually what we as an European ATT network wants to do. Okay. Um, yes, so it's already been said a bit about what engagement-based alternatives are. So it's ab about com going away from the approach that is about policing and mistrust and uh, restrictive conditions and coming to social works, social work that it's uh, tailored case, case management, management, empowerment, support, um, uh, reliable information. Um, mm, it's based on the IDC's research that brings together these many, many, many b best practices, uh, which shows that people are more, more likely to stay engaged and comply with immigration requirements, including negative decisions on their status, when they feel that they have been through fair process and they and can meet their basis uh, welfare needs. Okay, so a bit about the, our project, which is no detention necessary, and you will later hear from the Bulgarian project. Um, uh, we started out uh, in June, so it's quite a fresh project. It's only five months. Uh, the aim is to promote alternatives to detention, provide necessary evidence and arguments for, for advocacy against immigration detention at the national and regional level. Um, what we want to do, we want to identify a, quite a small group of migrants, well, about 25, 30 persons in return procedures, um, uh, the ones that are released thanks to our efforts or somebody else's, um, and then have alternative to detentions that are already in the law that are this, these conditional policing ATDs imposed on them. Um, so this is like quite a specific group um, that uh, we decided to, to run. Um, so you have to be uh, in imminent threat of detention actually, or you have to have these ATDs imposed. Um, uh, and actually why I'm here, because it's not very specifically, specifically addressed at uh, children, but uh, we want to focus on families with children um, and vulnerable persons. So in that way, we have to develop tools and uh, measures to work with, the, uh, with such a group. Um, we qualify, uh, since it's not a large number of persons that we want to take care of, so we have these qualification criteria. One of them is that the person 
will, is willing to cooperate with us because uh, we want to engage them in the process. Uh, so this initial intent to cooperate is crucial. Uh, then we have to uh, assess the risk of absconding, which, is, which should not be very, very high because it's only a pilot. Uh, and then since it's not, the government is not yet engaged in the pilot, we, all, we very much hope that it will be, but we start from the, like, the base, like level zero. So we have to make sure, we have to be sure that the basic needs of the person is, are uh, secured because as it was already mentioned, the alternatives will be effective if these persons have their basic, need met, basic need, needs met and we cannot really provide for accommodation or uh, social assistance. So yeah, basically what we can offer to these persons are legal assistance, psychological support for adults and children, uh, uh, tailored case management and financial support in case of emergency. But it's really about emergency and not steady regular support. Uh, what we can't offer is social support, accommodation and healthcare. And this is actually where we hope in the future that the governments will just buy in and step in. Uh, a few words about case management because I know that in the, the subsequent uh, presentation there will be a, a bit more about that. But if you don't know what case management is, and uh, to be honest, uh, until we got interested in this, we, we didn't really know that much about case management because it's not really a practice that we have in Poland, ne I, neither in uh, migration policies nor even in social work. So case management in, in, in terms of migration cases, it's about enhancement of well-being of these persons, provision of reliable information, but also empowerment of these people, referrals to other services um, and resources that we can find. Um, uh, but also supporting case resolution, meaning that uh, trying to see all the paths that these people can take into legalizing <coughs> their stay, um, informing them about them, uh, about the, the, the path, um, but also identifying barriers to, um, uh, that could be, um, Mm, that could prevent from like successful case resolution, which is possible only when you really have this relationship with a person when it, which is based on trust and regular meetings. Uh, then again, it's uh, case management responses response to complex needs and vulnerabilities, and this is why we believe that this is a solution for um, children and with families. And there's also interventions because um, everything can happen during the process. Um, yes, okay, so I would just uh, omit that because the Radostina will probably be talking about that, yes. Um, yeah, okay, so we, when we started working with families, we thought, okay, that's a piece of cake. We've been legally advising and uh, we've been running uh, integration assistance uh, for people with children, so we thought that that's basically the same, but it turns out case management, when you have children or families, it's a bit different. And now we're just changing our approach a bit so that we may really make sure that the child's best interest is at the center of the process. Because when you just really provide legal assistance to a person, you just assume that when the case will be resolved, then everybody, including the child, will be happy. But with case management, it's like more complex, and then we, re we really are working on tools to really make sure that we see the child and that we see the be their best interest. We obviously have child protection policies in our organizations that, um, pro uh, that help us, you know, dealing with children. Um, we treat, when we see, when we have a child in our case management, we tr um, assume that psychological support should be a rule unless otherwise, and unless stated otherwise. Uh, and at the moment we're considering whether uh, whether and from which age should we, as case managers, uh, hear a child, uh, whether should it should be a rule or whether it should be like only in cases that we feel that something is going on. So this is what we're thinking about at the moment. Okay, so it's only five months, so we've had, had 11 adults and six children. Um, and uh, there's a compliance rate of 95%. We have had one absconding that is still uh, hurts. Uh, it's quite fresh, um, but it's also it was, it was a bit of an eye opener because it's um, it's a case of a person who was under huge pressure from abroad, from their family abroad, to go to like to be to leave the country, leave Poland, and go to Germany. And this is as it was a very traditional family, and this person that we were managing, that, that we that, which is case we were managing was. 
um, like you know, somewhere in the be in between in the hierarchy, so it was not very high. Um, and you know, under the, the, there was a long time that uh, that they would uh, uh, re be resilient, but then. Uh, the pressure was too high and this person left the country, we were still in touch, but then it's obviously a failure. But then, if we, obviously we see it as a failure, but it's still a trigger for us to think about um, how do we work with people who, who are in these situations, because there are a lot of these situations, because this is a characteristic actually of the migration to Poland. It's what, it was mentioned earlier, Marin said about it, that we are developing models that are um, tailored to the situation that we are in. And actually we, what we are in Poland, with the situation that we are in in Poland, <laughs> is that many people find themselves in the situation of transit, because this is, this is just how it is. So now we're working on tools for how to, to change that. Uh, we've had two releases from detention and uh, one decision on return successfully challenged. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, we are starting not uh, without a government en engagement. Obviously, if you want to do like the whole um, system, you have to the whole model. You have to have government engagement, and this is why we're actually doing it because we want to convince governments that it's worth doing that. Um, so, what we would see in the future is obviously government engagement. Um, uh, then we would have to think about how to distribute the tasks in terms of, for example, screening and assessment. Who should do that? Engagement, uh, governments, uh, civil society organization. Actually, I think that every, every civil society that uh, organization that thinks about these models have to, at some point, think about that. Um, yeah, we're hoping for releases into the program once we establish a trust-based relationship with the government. And obviously, at the end, there's change in law that we hope for. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for that, Katarzyna. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Radostina Pavlova from Bulgaria. Uh, and then we'll take our, our last speaker. Um, I'm sorry to put you under pressure, but I'm going to have to ask you to try and be as short as possible, because we normally should be breaking at 1 o'clock. So sorry for that, but please. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so, Radajdina. Thank you very much. I will try to be as brief as I can. Uh, and things that uh, Kasha already discussed, I will just go over um, a lot faster. Um, thank you very much for coming to the session and for the invitation to our organization and uh, to myself. Um, I worked at the an organization which is called Center for Legal Aid Voice in Bulgaria as a legal and advocacy officer and for the project that I'm going to uh, talk to you about, I act as project manager. Um, you can see some information about our organization uh, on the screen. I'm not going to uh, repeat it all. We are essentially a legal aid provider to migrants and refugees, have been existing for uh, eight, nine years now. Uh, now, the project that uh, we are implementing with alternatives to detention, uh, similar in structure and approach uh, as the Polish one, came naturally to us. Uh, even though we've been providing uh, legal aid as a primary um, activity uh, and mission, the approach of working with the person long term and look at different kinds of needs has been the approach that the organization has been used. So it was not something, it came naturally to us. Um, but not in the systematic way to collect data and think about it in a, in a different manner. Um, now, we've been focusing on detention for a long time, uh, visits to the detention center since the very beginning of the organization. Uh, we've been doing Know Your Rights information sessions with the people who are placed there. Uh, we litigate and we do advocacy for limiting detention and applying alternatives. Um, the emphasis here is applying, so not um, designing alternatives so much as applying them. Um, and we have created a website um, dedicated to detention in Bulgaria and the region, so you can check it out if you would like. Um, now, I'm not really going to focus on unaccompanied minors, even though I agree that the situation in Syria and Bulgaria, Greece, Syria and Bulgaria, Greece, and, and other places. There is a good reason uh, for that. The focus on our work with this project and 
as it relates to detention is primarily on pre-removal detention. In Bulgaria, pre-removal detention for unaccompanied minors is prohibited in law. It does happen in practice, however, officially it doesn't happen. Uh, now, pre-removal detention in Bulgaria, it has a maximum of 18 months and um, mandated by law review every six months when it's uh, proposed to extend it. The grounds to detain for pre-removal detention, um, they are in accordance with the return directive, act of deportation order, and this is not in the return directive. Identity not established is in our law, risk of absconding or obstructing the execution of the order. We have two pre-removal detention centers with a capacity of 700 uh, taken together. And this type of detention is applied extensively. Um, in practice, pretty much every person who comes into Bulgaria irregularly to seek asylum, and that's the majority of people, if not all of them, is placed for at least some time in pre-removal detention on the basis of compulsory uh, deportation order which is issued. And you can see the numbers of uh, persons detained, 11, around 11,000 uh, for the two years. According to the ADA report, I believe the number would be higher. Okay, now, pre-removal detention, as um, uh, the, 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 your opening words um, uh, mentioned, is only legal when it's for the purpose of organizing and ensuring the return. Now, the return rate of people with deportation orders issued by the Bulgarian authorities is rather low. I did a rough estimate, and this is a number that I did, so it's not published on any government uh, site, so if you have questions about it or don't agree, you can ask myself. But at most, it's, it's about 20% at most, at most. And that's pretty generous. Um, now, um, children may be detained in pre-removal detention for a period of up to three months, which may, however, be, be prolonged, and must be placed in separate designated spaces in the detention centers uh, with their families. Um, 2,500 children or so were detained in uh, 2015 in pre-removal detention. They're presumed accompanied, and by that I mean that they can be legally placed in that detention because they are not unaccompanied. Now, a practice that we have observed when we have been in the detention center and working on the cases, as well as other NGOs and the Ombudsman of Bulgaria, is the practice of attaching unaccompanied de facto unaccompanied children to an adult traveling in the same group. So that child doesn't even get its own detention order that we can challenge or a deportation order. Actually, it gets its deportation order, but the, on the detention order, it is put under the name of the accompanying person. Um, that's a very troublesome practice, obviously. And they're placed with that adult. In some cases, we know that they didn't even know the person at all, and in some cases they were not even from the same country of origin. Um, a newer form of detention that's enforced since uh, the beginning of 2016 is to place asylum seekers in closed type facilities. Um, as was mentioned already, for the purpose of being able to, to assess uh, their application. Now, among the reasons, which are also in the directive, there is protection of national security or public order. This is the reason that has so far been used to place them in closed centers. Note that even though they're asylum seekers rather than people with um, a return order, there is the um, terms are a bit harsher. There is no maximum period. Um, there is no ban on uh, placing unaccompanied children so they can be placed. Asylum seeking unaccompanied children can be placed. Uh, in closed type facilities. For now, uh, there are, at the moment, there are only 24 asylum seekers placed in, in that closed type facility. That number will increase as more facilities are being turned from open to closed. To our knowledge, there are no children among them. Okay. I did mention that. Um, and uh, finally, another form that it's new for us, that it's in the law, but it's not implemented because the Ministry of Interior hasn't, doesn't have the readiness yet operationally, immigration detention, which will allow them to place every person coming into the country who doesn't have ID in 
immigration detention for up to 30 days. Detention of children is allowed for this measure, including for unaccompanied or separated. It has not yet put into practice, so we, we don't know how it's going to, to, to be applied. However, we do worry that it's going to be applied as extensively as pre-removal detention for con migration control purposes, as the situation is now. Alternatives uh, to detention, similar uh, to Sweden, we have one uh, measure in the law currently, and it's report, weekly reporting to police. In order to get this measure, um, you need to present proof that you have, it's a, it's a notarized declaration that you have a place to live and a declaration of financial support by a Bulgarian citizen or legal resident. Now, this is extremely difficult for anyone who's new to the country to, to accomplish. If they have, been, they have entered the country and gone straight to pre-removal detention, it, it's virtually impossible to have secured this. Um, a bill recently passed uh, first reading in Parliament. It introduces two additional alternatives. One is a money bond, and the other one is submitting of ID documents, such as a passport. Now, we have submitted a statement to the uh, leading parliamentary committee uh, on the bill, not just on alternatives because it contains other detention-related measures, but in terms of alternatives, we proposed in our um, statement that a provision is added on community-based alternatives, which would mean releasing into the community and applying case management. Um, our pilot project, um, is called protecting migrants with precarious status, decreasing the use of detention, and applying community-based alternatives. It's a two-year pilot. It's funded by the European Program for Integration and Migration, and we're conducting it in partnership with another organization, Bulgarian Lawyers for Human Rights in Bulgaria. Now, case management is one of four bigger components of the project, advocacy is the first one, communications, legal aid, meaning we go in the detention center to try to decrease the tension by um, helping individual uh, clients to be released, and case management. Now, um, applying alternatives to detention, uh, this is the um, aim of our case management components. Uh, the number of people uh, with whom we plan to work is 50 to 60 people at risk of detention over the 24 months. Um, the approach that we have adopted is holistic. That means we don't look uh, at just one aspect of the needs or issues related to, to the case, but apply a wraparound method. Um, the goal of this case management work that we're doing is to have each of the people that we work with stabilized in the community and not in detention until their case is resolved. And case resolution can be obtaining legal status in Bulgaria or an informed decision to return. An important part is gathering evidence on how well community-based alternatives work. Uh, and the indicators would be rates of absconding of people enrolled in the program, whether the migrants are engaged, whether they're complying with immigration and other procedures. And it was already mentioned, advocacy at the national EU level through the European ATD coalition, of which we are uh, also a member. One really important thing, I believe, is to keep in mind that the bigger goal of this work is to decrease the use of detention of migrants. At the individual level, yes, case resolution, one way or another, but the bigger goal is to decrease the use of detention of migrants. I don't think I have time to go into detail in each of the, the phases. Um, we do a screening interview uh, where it's decided whether the person would be suitable uh, to be part of the case management, assessment of needs. Uh, we prepare a case plan of what needs, needs to be done. Then interventions are being um, carried out, and that includes administrative help, uh, scheduling appointments for psychological, medical, legal, and other help, assistance with finding employment if the person is in fact allowed to work, um, help with involvement in the community. Um, something interesting that has, that has happened is that it's now not only us who try to help people with, with these needs, but, um, but people who are enrolled in the program or part of it are helping each other in some cases, which is quite, quite interesting. So we are, in a way, helping build, build a small community. Um, and then 
case closure uh, when the resolution of the legal status of the person uh, is achieved, then the case is closed and report is prepared outlining what the challenges were uh, along the way, any gaps in the system, and the steps that, that led to this resolution. Um, we have several uh, case resolutions, which I'll, I'll get to in a minute. Um, now, usually I get questions about how we select the people. Uh, migrants at risk of detention or redetention. Um, they need to declare an intent to comply with the procedure and, and the laws. Uh, that means that if we encounter a person who declares that their intent is to reach their brother in another European country as soon as they leave detention, we would likely not, not include that person. Some existing community connections or familiarity with the environment in Bulgaria to build on. We as an organization currently not um, getting support from government on this project, cannot uh, provide everything that a person needs to be stabilized in the community if there is nothing there at all. Um, some personality traits like being a resilient person, being motivated, we try to aim for diversity of the people that are included by gender, nationality, to the extent that this is uh, possible, their migration experience so far, whether they're, for example, still in uh, asylum procedure, but it's reaching its final negative end, or it's highly unlikely that they will receive um, asylum status, so some people are like that. Others we have taken out of detention, and there are some people who have been in the country for a long time, but their right to be there has expired for whatever reason, and they face return in detention. We haven't included any unaccompanied or separated children so far. Um, one reason that I mentioned is that they're officially not detained, so we cannot say that they're uh, at risk of detention. And the other thing is that they, their needs are such that we are not able to provide materially for them, especially when it comes to accommodation. Um, okay. So far we have 48 migrants participating as of end of last month. Different countries of origin, you can see them, Iran, Iraq, Cote d'Ivoire, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Ghana, Palestine. You will notice that there are no Syrians. The reason for that is Syrians are the one group likely to get positive decisions um, on their asylum claims, and they're therefore not at risk of detention. Um, by gender, a lot more males, which reflects the general population uh, of migrants in, in detention and in asylum procedure. Um, the length of stay in Bulgaria is something uh, important. The majority have been in Bulgaria for some time, for one to two years, or three to five, some of them. We only have a few people who are recent, and we intend to include more recent, more recent people in, in, in the group. Okay. You can see the ages here, uh, mostly young people, 18 to 25, but a sizable group of 36 to 45. Now, children. Uh, 11 people of those have children who are in Bulgaria, whether they were born here or they came with the parents. So when we work, I said that we don't, we haven't included children separately, and <clears throat> we don't really work with the children at this point directly. We work with the parents. However, what we, <laughs> the work that we do with that group affects their children, uh, which is obvious. Um, Children in country of origin, uh, four people report that they have children in their country of origin. Okay. So far, very pre preliminary result, even though it's going to be soon one year um, of working on this officially. We don't have anyone that we know has absconded, left the country irregularly or gone missing. So we haven't lost touch uh, with any of them so far. I'm. I suspect that we'll probably have at least one or two, two cases, however, so far we're good, uh, which indicates high levels of engagement. Nobody has been detained, again, from the group that we uh, work with. Nobody has been forcibly deported or deported, let's say. Um, resolved cases, we have four of 
as of end of last month, four were decisions to return to the country of origin, and two people have received humanitarian status in Bulgaria. Um, okay, uh, one minute? Or, okay. Now, the factors for success, as we see them uh, right now, um, there is a high level of trust on the part of the migrants. We are known in the, in the migrant community and have a good name as a reliable provider of legal aid, so that explains a lot of the uh, trust that we are happy to have. Community connections are extremely helpful. Existence of some social milieu in Bulgaria, whether it's with Bulgarians or, the, or their own ethnic communities. Support from employers and faith organizations. Employers are becoming more and more engaged with that, which is very interesting and very positive. Employers of the people that we work with for when they had a permit or if they still do. Um, buying from the authorities. For now, our relationship with the government on this, it's informal and persuasive. We have succeed, su been successful in convincing um, them not to re-detain a person when they intended to do so. That's the present situation. But we don't have a formal agreement or, or partnership with them. Um, it can become more involved. It should become more involved. Uh, there may be a possibility to become a partner of sorts. And the very last slide that I have, the key challenges and risks that we see, major, major issue, limited or no, no channels for legal status outside the asylum system. Um, it's a lengthy process, the case management work towards the case resolution, so it's very challenging and difficult to show quick results, how it works, it doesn't work, and for the person also it's a, it's a long process. Difficult access to housing, we are not, we don't have the mandate or the means even to provide anything like that. And there is no state provided housing outside of those who are in asylum procedure and that's why I was quite impressed that in Belgium there is such, such housing provided. Um, no access to state provided social services if no residence papers including to healthcare so people with health problems need to either find money somehow to pay or rely on uh, the NGO sector or private paid providers. Um, I believe that there is a risk that migrants will lose hope that there will be a resolution to their case and their motivation to comply with the program and with immigration procedures might, might decrease uh, for this. We continue to advocate for community-based alternatives in national law, use the evidence gathered for advocacy also at the EU level. Um, I did mention we intend to include more recent migrants and to um, start discussing a closer collaboration with the MOA, Minister of Interior with the thought of a possibility whether it, they could release detainees into the program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh. Thank you very much, Radestina, for, for that very, uh, I think, interesting presentation on a promising project in a very challenging environment, as I've, uh, as I've also witnessed um, myself. Um, I now turn to the last uh, speaker, and uh, uh, this is uh, a Poppy uh, Kliva from uh, um, SOS Children's Villages in Greece. Uh, Poppy, I'm afraid I'm going to have to also uh, put you under a bit of pressure. Um, we really need to... I'll do my best. Uh, well, uh, I probably have the time to say hi and bye and let's discuss everything during lunch break. But actually, I want to thank you for having me here today and uh, for the privilege to share with you how we work with unaccompanied children in Greece. But let's start with a few unpleasant facts. Since March 2016, over 9,000 unaccompanied children have been registered in Greece. Uh, today, almost two-thirds of the children that are still in, in the country are waiting for appropriate accommodation. Among them, 
400 are still in detention, either in police stations or closed reception centers. Uh, unfortunately, the latest data uh, show us that the situation is still difficult due to the lack of designated spaces for children and the continuation of arrivals at the Greek islands. islands. Well, SOS Children's Villages have been uh, providing services for um, many years in uh, Greece. And we've decided on early 2016 to, to be active. And while dealing with an emergency situation, we decided to cooperate with the Greek government, local and international NGOs in order to take these children out of detention and offer proper care uh, in order to offer them the opportunity not to rely on smugglers and put themselves at risk of abuse and exploitation. <clears throat> we supported either directly or indirectly different projects in the mainland and Lesbos Island. At the moment we run two houses for uh, unaccompanied boys in Athens and another one in northern Greece for girls, where we also host underage mothers with their babies. From the beginning, we also provided psychosocial support, material aid, education, recreational and sports activities in different camps in the, in the mainland and Lesbos Island. Well, oops, sorry. Well, fleeing war, poverty, even terrorism, these children endured inhuman difficulties on their way to Europe. And uh, finally, they've reached Europe and their hopes for a, a, a safe environment, uh, safety, was rewarded by months in detention. So it was our obligation to do something for these children to feel children again so that they can rely on people of trust and regain their confidence in their future. And by commenting on the questions of why children cannot accept uh, easily, they are reluctant to accept support, even if this support is of high quality, our answer is that it takes time and a lot of effort to make children trust us. It's important to build a relationship, to make them understand that we are there for them. It is not a matter of minutes. It is a matter of, of months, most of the time, to make them understand. So these children need to be better equipped to rebuild their lives and contribute to society, uh, whether in Greece, another European country, or their country of origin. Oh, sorry for, <laughs> for this, but I'm sure that you've heard about all these symptoms during the last three days from the different personal stories. Uh, based on our statistics, one third of the children living in our care at the moment have been detained. The personal, <coughs> so, excuse me, besides the fear and lack of trust, most of them report that they had to stay in, um, in a room with no related adults. They didn't have access to bathing facilities. They, they've received food once a day. They didn't, <coughs> excuse me, they didn't have access to natural life, light. And most of the days they didn't even have the, the right to go for a, for a walk outside of the room. On top of this, Communication with their families was rare and difficult, and they were not provided the necessary legal support and information about their cases. <coughs> Thank you. Well, I will briefly try to describe the four main areas that constitute our approach in this project. From the first day, that the child arrive in our care, a team of professionals work on providing personalized care, a psychological assessment, a review on their legal case, a schedule based on their needs and their knowledge is rapidly organized in order for the child to feel part of a family 
that not only understand but respect their needs. While at the same time, the, the limitation and the rules that every teenager should follow are well established. It seems that unaccompanied children coming from abusive or neglected, neglecting family environment are more severely traumatized by the detention experience. It is like the detention is reawakening older traumas and the child hasn't formed the necessary coping mechanism to deal with them. As a result, the psychological care needed to reverse detention consequences is more intense and long term. Well, when released from detention, the majority of unaccompanied children are oriented towards Ill illegitimate paths on continuing their journey. Since their families back home have information from and rely mostly on smugglers. Giving the whole picture and all legal information to them proves quite crucial at this point in order to shift their minds to a legal option. And especially by establishing a communication path with the families, assist the staff not only to understand the real reason behind the dangerous journey, but also to work and create a holistic plan where the child is an important part of the decisions. And sometimes the connection with the families, especially for boys that are considering themselves adults, show them the, the importance of not only to be connected, but also to reevaluate the experience of the journey. Well, applying the pedagogical approach that SOS Children's Villages worked for years has extremely beneficial results. The role of pedagogue caregiver is invaluable since the bond with the children when they work together on their life skills cultivation is strong. Working on comprehending European cultures, culture, whereas we focus on education, is a combination that works miracles towards the development of the citizens of 21st century. Regardless of the final destination of these children, these skills are the base for establishing a future for them and their families. By supporting the children to attend school, assist them with social services, organizing outdoor activities, we support their social integration. At the same time, this has a positive effect to local communities, since through daily interaction, it is easier for the neighborhood to understand the needs and aspirations of these children and accept them, accept them in their lives. As you can see, if you can see the data on the screen, uh, we had no relocation cases, since relocation only applies on those who entered the country before 2016 but gradually build trust of the children to the system and their caregivers, leads them to engaging to indicated procedures and legal paths, thus children stay longer, waiting to be united with family members. <clears throat> Constant legal support leads to faster procedures compared to the time they would need if they tried on their own living in a camp. It is worth noting that almost half of the children decide, decided to apply legally for asylum in Greece. And it seems that our efforts lead the children to stay in our care for a longer period, giving us the opportunity to have sufficient time to work on their psychological support and legal case. Our statistics show us that uh, the average duration a child stays in our care is almost doubled when compared to other facilities in Greece. Unfortunately, no data are available for children staying in camps. Well, after living in an organized environment, sometimes for the first time in their lives, the children acquiring a plethora of skills that improve their self-confidence and prepare them for their adulthood. It is important to support them to find their talents and create a future wherever their choices lead them. Although sometimes it is difficult to hear them practicing on piano or the guitar during <laughs> midday <laughs> when you want to have a nap. 
It is without doubt that children in camps encounter any kind of danger, dealing with smugglers being the most dangerous. With no direct access to social services and legal aid, they attempt to continue their journey, and in order to support their, their endeavor, they involve themselves in illegal activities. Without education, even if they achieve their goal, they are totally unprepared to act as responsible adults and citizens. The frustration and lack of perspective most probably encourage further illegal activity. Our experience shows us, though, that even children that were exposed in danger, when found in the right environment, learn how to trust and work on their life skills. So what needs to be done? What we have to suggest? And since it is difficult to work on the source of what makes these children traveling alone, we should focus on creating facilities that not only host, but support children the way their rights demand. Especially in Greece, we need to work for establishing a foster care system, since this is a big gap even for local population. More professionals should be trained to accommodate the divertive needs of these teenage groups in order not to lose another generation and everyone may be benefited by their skills and talents. And local authorities should work on training their officials so that, so that they can accommodate traumatized children. And last but not least, public funding should be secured in order to ensure sustainability of such efforts. Well, thank you for your attention. I did my best, <laughs> and I'm at your disposal. Thank you very much indeed, Poppy, and thank you indeed for being succinct, but at the same time, it was a very rich uh, and full presentation uh, of obviously an extremely challenging situation and some very important work that's being done uh, by you in Greece. Uh, one very last thing. I have promised to give the, shore, the, the, the floor very briefly uh, to somebody else from Greece, from, to uh, Laura, who's working for um, an organization called Metadrasi. Um, so I can give you the floor for two minutes, but really only two minutes, and then we have to close for lunch. Well, so sorry. Uh, everybody's uh, hungry. Uh, I will try to be very short. I would like to share with you some uh, very good practices for, la for alternative for detention, like foster family that we try, like Metadasi to, I mean, there is a foster family, one year and a half. We place already 39 uh, kids in Greek families, which is not the best practice in Europe. Uh, I would like to point out, and maybe to, to, uh, to, to leave this panel, that is so important, the role of guardianship. Uh, guardianship methods started in Greece. Uh, it was pilot thing, uh, you know, with ten guardians, very in, uh, in cooperation with the prosecutor, of course. Now uh, we have 900 kids under guardianship in Greece. So I hope this year, in, uh, until the end of the year, we will have very interesting data on these kids uh, and uh, to, to, to share with you. Uh, so another good practice is urgent foster family. So more and more with all these numbers, because numbers today is, uh, in Greece, unaccompanied children, is uh, uh, the official numbers is 3,200, 150. We, uh, from our uh, estimation, is uh, more than uh, 3,100 to uh, 200. So from these kids, only 1,100 is in shelter. Where are the rest? The rest in detention, hotspots, patras, the port, and more and more, uh, we have small children uh, that somebody is accompanying in our office asking for a guardian. So we invented the new uh, action, which is urgent foster family. And that's uh, something very useful for countries like uh, Greece, Italy, that uh, we have this, uh, this pressure. So these kids, 40%, I really want uh, to say that, is reunification cases. So we have to think, all of us, if bureaucracy is something uh, that helps to manage migration flow, or bureaucracy, you are using a tool, bureaucracy, member states, to uh, delay your reunification cases. So uh, I would uh, come back to this uh, question uh, that I heard uh, in the morning, uh, uh, what it was, uh, uh, the added value. What is the added value? Yes, is that 90% of these kids will stay in Europe. 
one day they will be European citizens. So are we going to let them living one year and two years in camps uh, to, to be, uh, you know, in, a, uh, in risk uh, with, uh, with abuse, with the drugs? We see it every day in Greece, this, uh, these cases. Kids are they are calm, they are not fine, they are traumatized already, and maybe they get much more traumatized situation in Greece. And one day there will be uh, Belgium citizens, uh, I don't know, German citizens. So uh, the last thing I want to share with you is a very good example of Portugal. So it's uh, nice to hear that some countries, some member states are not solidar. Uh, uh, yes, there is no solidarity. And there are states that are very solid. So they, they show the solidarity. And they took kids, they go we cooperate metadacy with NGOs from Portugal. And they took kids that there are no relocation, no reunification cases through the doubling 17, the article. And they are still are in Portugal. It's more than six, seven months. They are open to take more kids. So I really uh, ask the uh, European Commission to see that and to give some motivation, some uh, funding also, because in the end, we fund Portugal, can you imagine, as NGO. We give the money 300 euro per month for 18 months. And we ask, really, it's a request here, if there are countries that uh, they want to show their solidarity to countries that uh, they have so much pressure, like Greece, Italy, uh, to give some motivation also, not only to think punishing uh, other, other member states. So um, <coughs> really we have to think, I mean, uh, one day this, uh, these kids will be citizens, and I, I'm very glad that uh, we have these presentations. If we, we have to, to be dreamer, we have to be fast, and we have to think something crazy, and I will tell you now and finish. <laughs> let you eat. Okay. The one idea, now let me tell, we have to really think a flexible system that when a kid arrives in Greece, let's say, has to be registered and then to see, is there any place for these kids to stay in, to be in a shelter? There is no place, that's for sure. Maybe we can see and uh, cooperate to see with another member state to transfer this kid very quickly to another member state and continue the procedures there. I think we have to see that. I know it's not the right time uh, with all this rise of uh, xenophobia, etc. But uh, uh, maybe it would be very late one day if we don't uh, go uh, further on this uh, on this kind of ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Laura, and thank you very much to all of you. It's been, I think, a very rich and fruitful discussion. Uh, obviously, the challenges are enormous. We've, we've heard them, I think, very vividly described by you and, and also by the panelists. Uh, but I think there are a lot of promising solutions that are being developed and are being implemented. So let's be optimistic uh, that the future will hold better things for, uh, for children uh, in migration. Uh, so thanks again to the organizers and thanks to all of you for a very interesting discussion. Have a nice lunch. Bye.